There's a bit of Americana for you. The crowds gathering for Winston Cup racing at Darlington, South Carolina, as they have every year since 1950. Now, is your television screen half empty or is it half full? You see, it all depends on how you look at it. It's a lot like life. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Despain. Special NASCAR today. And here on ESPN and ESPN2, we're warming things up for the upcoming Trans South 400. It's our first telecast of the year, and that's special for us, and we are going to cover it as no other network can. It all depends on how you look at it. Listen to the views we're going to give you of this thing. First of all, up in the booth, we got the guys with the ties, Bob, Nettie, and... Bob, Benny, and Ned are going to call it flag to flag on ESPN. Yours truly, tastefully dressed for any motorsports occasion, will first do the NASCAR Today thing and then jump over to the other network, ESPN2. Here's what we got. Follow me on this, if you will. Front row, got Jeff Gordon on the pole, got his teammate Labonte alongside. The Hendrick cars took the top three spots. We're going to watch him go into turn one from this car. Kenny Schrader has onboard cameras. Beside him, Ricky Rudd. That's where I was looking at you through the fisheye. He's got cameras and radios. We'll move back through the field. Come with me. Daryl Waltrip. He'll have cameras and radios out of the way. ESPN is coming through. None of these guys. we got to go all the way back. Can you see that six? car back there mark martin he's going to have cameras further back we'll have musgrave with cameras and in the back the pontiac perspective i guess for michael waltrip he'll have cameras and radios that's the deuce coverage all right then we got the guys dressed for pit road success fire suited up for any story or anything else that might come at them they're the best in the business and we're going to go to them first for a little whip around of the stories we'll cover in this half hour first thing we're going to do Call the doctor, Jerry Punch. What's the headline story here at Darlington? Thanks, Dave. For the first time in her 45-year history, the famed lady in black has been given a facelift here. The smooth new payment, well, it's certainly different. Let's go to Ned and Benny. I tell you one thing, this racetrack is going to be awfully fast, over 170 miles an hour qualifying, and then spotters are going to be very critical. Spotters, spotters will be very critical here today, and we'll cover that story. Now let's go back to the pits and John Kernan. Guys, all this year, everybody's talked about the dominance of the Chevy. Next week, NASCAR taking all three makes of automobiles to the wind tunnel to get some aerodynamic answers. Bob? And we'll be talking about the hottest team in NASCAR Winston Cup racing, not the one-car Richard Childress team, but instead the three-car Rick Hendrick stable. Dave? All right, that's the big picture. Now let's kind of narrow the focus down. Let's get into some of the details. And I want to start with a little more extended examination from the doctor of this new track surface. Since its construction in 1950, Darlington has posed the ultimate challenge for both man and machines. This unique egg-shaped configuration featuring turns of different radius and degrees of banking has produced a logistical nightmare for chassis specialists. And in recent years, the surface itself has become abrasive and very eroded. Therefore, it begins to chew up tires. In fact, tires literally come apart much as cheese would against a grater. In fact, the tire companies themselves have had a difficult time building enough tires to satisfy the teams throughout the 400 miles of racing competition and if you do run the distance you have to try to overcome overheating problems from chunks of rubber that get stuck in the front grill this rubber can cause steaming and overheating but no longer 1995 a brand new racing surface smooth and silky smooth the drivers say it may be the smoothest surface in all of nascar but smooth surfaces mean better traction higher speeds 27 drivers in today's field broke the old track record including our pole sitter jeff gordon who shattered it by four miles an hour but escalated speeds means more problems for drivers they must concentrate they must focus concentration poise and the big p here at darlington that is patience therefore today it is going to be whoever can concentrate at these speeds and remain patient but we have a couple of guys who tame this famed lady in black and they are standing by here's benny parsons and ned jarrett no jerry you got me confused i'm parsons not pearson i never tamed this racetrack this tough this baby is too tough to tame ned yeah winning one time here doesn't necessarily mean that you tamed it we were in victory lane one time each here in past years but yes you do have to have a lot of patience on this racetrack we've already seen a lot of trouble here in the last couple of days because of the extra speed the smooth track doesn't necessarily take away all the bad things we've heard about darlington over the years and there's one guy down in the pit area that has patience and he's one of the smartest drivers out there and he's standing 
standing by with John Kern. He's also a driver who has tamed this fame lady in black. Now, Daryl, on Friday before qualifying, you told me this new pavement was going to kind of hinder you veterans, but then you go out and you qualify six. What's the story? Well, it's good. It's real good for qualifying. I mean, you can really, really gas it up and go hard. And I knew that, and I just had to convince myself of it. The deal to now is the race. And this is where I think experience and uh, knowing the racetrack and knowing what it can do to you, I think that's what's going to pay off is today in the race itself. It's a shorter race. It's set up. The scenario is great for a real de demolition derby. It's uh, 100 miles shorter. Everybody thinks the track is all brand new and different. They had not moved those walls. They're right where they always was. So I don't really think you're going to see a whole lot of difference here. I think you're going to see a real wild race. And uh, wait, look from pra <clears throat> excuse me from practice. Uh, we're all going to be chasing that 24 car because he's quick and he hadn't raced a lot here. So maybe some of that experience I was talking about, maybe he'll gain some of it today the hard way. <laughs> well, as Daryl says, Dave, look, it's know. the uh, same old Darlington, really. And you're going to see it as you've never seen it before on our Double Punch Network, ESPN and ESPN2. And we've got all the action previews on NASCAR today. Atlanta, Jeremy Mayfield slaps the wall. Big, long slide that reminds you how fast these cars really go. Looks like a routine one-car deal until, boom, Michael Waltrip arrives rather late upon the scene. A couple of replays indicate how scary this really was. Mayfield's car had virtually stopped. Michael slammed him in the back, running almost full speed. The immediate concern, of course, is for driver safety. Second issue with two lanes open on the bottom to make evasive moves. Why did Michael drive into the back of that car? Well, how better to get the answer than to ask Michael? Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, Dave, let's ask Michael. If Michael's just coming off the stand here being introduced, well, he will start 28th today. And uh, Michael, big smile. Glad to have you with us. Uh, we just saw that horrific incident in Atlanta, and we was it scared us. We watched it through a camera lens. It had to frighten you. You watched it through the windshield. Yeah, it scared me to death. I'm coming off turn two, and I'm racing with uh, a car that's right behind me and um, coming down the back straightaway. And, and Jeremy had wrecked so long before that uh, – pretty much the smoke had cleared except for where he was and the car in front of me checked up and I cut over to the left to see what the deal was and I saw a ball of smoke and I, I went high because I didn't have any idea where he was where he'd been or where he's going and it, it was the wrong guess I should have went low because I drove right into him fans have called and written and said where was a spotter but in all fairness to you and your spotter spotters are asked to do a lot during a race for a driver well I've I made a commitment to myself a long time ago I would never blame a wreck on a spotter I got to drive the car that's my job that's his job is to help me he was watching me race those other cars and was trying to tell me I was clear really a spotter needs to be watching ahead watch the the cars that are racing ahead of him so when they do mess up he can let his driver know there's trouble ahead he just happened to be trying to help me with the situation I was in off of two and didn't see the car wreck up ahead and so uh, when I hit Jeremy he was as surprised as I was. Mike, best of luck today. It'll be better today, I promise. Depends on Pontiac's running good. Dave? All right, it's a mile and a half racetrack. You can't look all the way around it all the time. The spotters are on the roof of the press box. Here's what it sounds like. Bill Weber's up there on a spotter radio. Dave, this is the best seat in the house, but no one will be sitting here today because these spotters will race 400 miles standing up. This is the actual radio that Dale Cagle will use to help guide Ricky Rudd and the Tide Ford around this racetrack. They'll be watching for trouble and traffic. You'll hear terms like, go high, stay low. The caution just came out. And you'll also hear the term clear, meaning Ricky has cleared lap traffic and can get back in line. Really, it's like having your own personal helicopter reporter to tell you how to get to work every day. Get in the right lane, get in the left lane, get behind that red car, and the traffic light just changed. But it's just an insurance policy, a second set of eyes. The driver can never relax and must race well beyond the hood of his car. Spotting is a difficult task, and at times you must be very thick-skinned. It will play a role today on this tight, fast track. Let's go to Benny and Ned. And when did spotting start? I think it started about 15 years ago when some of our owners rented suites at Charlotte Motor Speedway. They would go up in the suite and watch the race. They took a radio with them, and they would tell their driver about trouble in front of them. 
and all of a sudden NASCAR realized and all the other teams realized it was a great advantage. That's when NASCAR started giving spotters tickets to go up to the highest place at the racetrack and watch their driver go around the racetrack. And Ned Jarrett, you spotted some last year. It's a tough job. It really is a tough job. I did have the opportunity to spot a few races for Dale when I wasn't watching television. And I'll tell you, the concentration level has to be equal, really, to the driver out there. You cannot take your mind off of what's going on out there because you got to look ahead, you got to look at the driver, you got to look at everybody on the racetrack, basically. It is a tough, tough job. My hat's off to them. Dave? All right, guys, next up on NASCAR today, the subject guaranteed to arouse the passion of Winston Cup fans. When we come back, we're going to talk about Ford versus Chevrolet. About 20 minutes to the start of the Trans-South 400. You see the overview from the Family Channel blimp as we come to you with NASCAR today here from Pitt Road. And we look at the story of Chevy dominance of this 1995 season to date. I mean, they've won everything in sight, haven't they? And so that brings us to the story that everybody's talking about this weekend. NASCAR's plan to impound three cars from this field. A Pontiac, a Ford, and a Chevrolet after the race, take them to Marietta, Georgia, put them in the wind tunnel that Ford uses, then haul them to Detroit and put them in the GM wind tunnel, run a bunch of tests, and not tell anybody the results, but use that information to perhaps revise the rules. What might the rules revisions be? Chevy wants this, Ford wants that. It's point, counterpoint, and for that, let's go, first of all, to John Kernan. Dave, I'm standing by with Jack Roush. He owns two teams, two Ford Thunderbird teams here on the Winston Cup circuit. And Jack, concerning the wind tunnel testing that's coming up this week that NASCAR is going to do, what do the Ford teams hope to learn from that? Well, first about the test, let me say that I think that the, that, that the manufacturers, both Ford and uh, General Motors, inviting NASCAR into their research and uh, development facilities to be able to, to look at these cars in the interest of parity is a milestone that we'll look back on for years to come. We'll set a new, uh, a new uh, period of cooperation in the interest of parity and reducing the development costs for, for all the teams. I think this is just going to be great. This is going to be a really big week to be able to, to see what happens. Um, the dark side for me says that we may just have, all the Ford teams may have just gone to sleep this winter and we're not very good teams right now. We're either gonna find that, uh, that the Lumina was not such a good race car and that the Monte Carlo is the equal of the Thunderbird or we're gonna find that uh, the Thunderbird uh, is not the equal of what the new Monte Carlo is. And uh, you know, being on one side of that, uh, if the Monte Carlo proves not to be better than the Thunderbird, I'm gonna be uh, really, uh, really embarrassed. Uh, there'll be two questions. The first question is, how much downforce do the cars make? And the second question will be, for that downforce, how much drag do they take? On a really short race course, if you could generate enough downforce by adding spoilers to the front or to the, to the back of a Thunderbird to make it equal to the Monte Carlo, that could make parity. It can make parity at Wilkesboro. It can make parity at Martinsville and places like that. But if, if, uh, if you have to add the spoilers to make the downforce on this Thunderbird, as I believe that uh, we will find, uh, then when we go to Indianapolis, we go to Pocono, we go to Michigan, we go to Atlanta, the cars won't be able to race uh, in the same straightaway as, as they could in Atlanta last time. It's going to be real interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, that's from the Ford camp. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch, who's with the Chevrolet camp. And I'm with Richard Childress, the car owner for Dale Earnhardt. And RC, uh, no doubt about it, Chevrolet has dominated the early part of the year, the first four races. And i got to ask you point blank, does the Monte Carlo have an unfair advantage? I wouldn't say it's an unfair advantage. It could have a little advantage. You know, we don't know right yet. I think it's too early in the season to make that call. Uh, you know, last year, I think uh, Ford won 20 out of 30 races. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's no offset than it was last year. Puts you on the spot now. NASCAR's gotten a lot of grief, a lot of calls, a lot of complaining. If you're a NASCAR, what do you do right now? Well, again, I think it's too early in the season to make any type of judgment calls, you know, because, you know, if you take Rick Hendricks' three cars out of, out of down here, it's less than two one-hundreds difference between the first Ford and the first Chevy. And it's been that way most of the year. And, and I think what's happened, you know, Rick has just really got some good programs going with his race teams, and they've worked hard to earn where they're at. And I just don't see taking anything away from them guys right now. Well, RC, thanks for joining us. Dave, if you look at the points, it's the top ten. It's five Chevrolets and five Fords, so uh, it looks pretty even right now. 
Well, absent from that debate, of course, is Pontiac. Haven't won a race since the end of 1993, but they have a new car tested it at Atlanta within the last two weeks. They've taken it back to do some rework on it, and you'll see that car, 1996 debut at Daytona. Behind me, pole sitter Jeff Gordon, Hendrick Motorsports sweep of the top three. They are the top Chevy team right now, and they're going to be our story as we come back live at Darlington, South Carolina, NASCAR today with a pre-race special. Hello, 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 down here, the one with the receding hairline. Hello, everybody, NASCAR Today, we're back here on the grid, dominated up front by the Hendrick Racing Teams, took the top three qualifying spots. Rick Hendrick, a guy who kind of specializes in doing things everybody else says would be impossible, like the three-car team. Well, what have they done? They've won three of the races, and they've got the top three qualifying spots here, led by the kid who drives this car. Number 24, Jeff Gordon, has been on a fast track ever since he moved into Bob Jenkins' neighborhood up there in Indianapolis, and Jenkins had a chance to watch this kid come up through the ranks. How about it, Bob? What's your take on today's pole sitter? Yeah, but you know, I remember him first watching him drive a sprint car around East Bay Raceway near Tampa at the age of 12, and he was holding his own against the best sprint car veterans. Then he did come to Indianapolis. We watch him grew up in the sprint cars and the open wheel cars on Thursday night and Saturday night thunder. Gordon, without doubt, the uh, hottest driver in NASCAR Winston Cup racing today, but his teammate, Terry Labonte, his second year with Rick Hendrick Racing, and uh, the 1984 champion seems to be reborn with a win already at Richmond. The third member of the Rick Hendrick team is really the veteran of the team. He's the only one without a victory. His best finish so far was at Richmond of fourth. Standing by with Ken Schrader, Dr. Jerry Punch. And Bob Kenny Schrader will start third today, and he can take some special pride in the fact that his teammates have done awfully well, particularly Jeff Gordon. Uh, what an incredible young talent. The kid's just real good. There ain't nothing you can say about it. He's got a good car, good team over there, like a lot of other people do. But, uh, you know, he, Jeff's going to be winning races no matter who he's driving for, and I'm, we're just glad he's winning them in one of Rick's cars. You came so close to winning here last fall, Kenny. You dominated this race. The last 95 laps, the, a crack in the engine block. Something that just doesn't happen happened to you, and you didn't get to go to victory lane. Got to feel good about your shot today. Well, we do. You know, we're just kind of wondering what's going to happen next. Everything that's not supposed to happen seems like it happens to us. But, uh, no, uh, the car's running real good. Obviously, the other two, Terry and Jeff, are. And we're just going to worry about lap 294 or whatever it is, something like that. You know, it's the first 400-miler here, I guess, and uh, we're excited about it. They try to keep it all even in the Hendrick Motorsports team. Of course, they've won up front with their rookie driver, Jeff Gordon, a couple of years ago. Now they've won with Labonte. It's got to be Schrader's turn today, Dave. A lot of people pulling for Kenny Schrader here at Darlington this afternoon. What are we, about 15 minutes away from the start as uh, we go live here for our first big race of the season on ESPN and ESPN2. It's going to be terrific. It's going to be exciting. So what you need to do is, you know, call the cable company, get your picture-in-picture -picture thing going, whatever you want to do to be able to see it. Every way we're going to offer it to you here live from Darlington, South Carolina. NASCAR Today pre-race preview. We'll be back to wrap it up. Family Channel blimp pictures. They built this place in 1950 and shaped it this way so they wouldn't have to mess up the fishing pond outside turn two. Just part of the legend of Darlington. And we're going to cover the entire Darlington story here for you. But one of the stories that everyone is talking about, of course, is this week of the comeback. Michael, uh, Michael, Michael, what's his name? Up there in Chicago making his comeback, of course. And then here in Winston Cup Racing, Two drivers coming back from bad crashes and eye injuries to get back in a racetrack. We'll start with Ernie Irvin, tested here at Darlington and answered a lot of questions. First thing's gonna be, what are you doing testing? Um, not, just trying to find out if I can uh, run again. Larry and me talked and he said, well, where do you wanna test at? I said, Darlington. And I said, because that's a hard place. I figured that uh, the guys were coming down to test, and I figured I'd put this push car together and uh, just be able to come down here and be able to just run nonchalance. Not really, we're not preparing for anything. It's not, not that we're going racing next week, and uh, it's just a matter of just doing some stuff. And, uh, you know, it's been seven months since my accident, and uh, I'm ready to start doing some racing and uh, ready to, to start doing some testing and uh, Find out what I can do.
No, we're not talking about Ernie Irvin. It's Chuck Bown who took this hard driver's side first lick at Pocono last summer. Put him out of action until he did some testing at Richmond two months ago. Then he made some long runs last week at Bristol and in fact came back yesterday here at Darlington for his first real practice session followed by the most spectacular qualifying attempt of the day. Watch 32, the active motorsport Chevrolet. Tried to run turn four wide open. Did three nice spins down the front straightaway. Didn't look like he was going to hit anything, but then right there just nicked the wall. We're glad to see both of those guys back, but we are especially glad to officially open the ESPN Winston Cup season from Darlington with the young singers of Darlington and our national anthem. Yahoo, an American classic. I'll tell you what, what a great way to kick off this spectacular afternoon of racing here at Darlington, South Carolina. So much a part of the history and tradition of Winston Cup racing. Got about a minute, guys, to wrap it up. Final observation for NASCAR today before you go to work, Dr. Punch. You can't mention experience without talking about this guy behind me. Awesome Bill. Now, he won the race here last September. He settled a pole in this race a year ago. He starts 17th today with a brand-new race car and a brand-new race team, McDonald's Ford. Watch for Awesome Bill to be a factor before we run 400 miles today. Let's go to John Kernan. Jerry, starting back here, 23rd position, Dale Earnhardt, seven-time Winston Cup champion. Last year, he tied Richard Petty's mark of seven cup titles. Today, he goes for another title that uh, some people might even consider more difficult than winning seven Winston Cups, and that is the 10th win here at Darlington. If Earnhardt can come up with win number 10 today, he will tie David Pearson. We'll hear more from Dale a little later. So many exciting stories to cover and so many interesting ways for us to do it. That's going to kind of wrap up my NASCAR Today gig here. Remind you that next week we'll be coming to you doing a similar thing up at Bristol with the Saturday show at 11 o'clock Eastern time and then the Sunday pre-race show. We do our best to stay on top of this Winston Cup thing for you fans. Now what we're going to do next... I'm going to kind of hand things over to Bob Jenkins and the guys in the ties and let them do their thing up topside. I'm going to hop on over and uh, get into my ESPN2 costume and get ready to take care of that onboard coverage and team radio thing that we'll be doing over in the other network. We're going to split the signals here just momentarily. So I think that pretty well sets the stage for this 1995 kickoff of the Winston Cup season. One last thing. I never come to Darlington without thinking about Dale Singleton and Richie Panch. And guys, we're still thinking about you. I hope you all go out there and have a terrific race today. I hope you folks at home have a terrific time watching it as only we can bring it to you. I'm Dave Despain, and that wraps it up for NASCAR Today. Stand by for Bob Jenkins next. The weather is perfect in South Carolina. The fans are ready. The NASCAR Winston Cup drivers have a monumental challenge ahead of them on this Sunday afternoon. The word to best describe Darlington is speed. 1957, a blistering 115 miles per hour. By 68, the pace was up to 148. And now in 1995, for the first time, a lap over 170. Last year, an abrasive track surface caused excessive tire wear. Pit stops were frequent simply because tires wouldn't last very long. The particles of rubber clogged the grills of many of the cars, stopping the airflow 
and that caused overheating problems. The lady in black was fast, but her odd shape and abrasive track surface caused many problems for those who tried to tame her. But Bob, not today. For the first time in the 45-year history of this famed lady in black, uh, she has gotten a complete new facelift. Nice, brand new pavement here, and new pavement means higher speeds. In fact, 27 cars today shattered the old track record. Our pole sitter, Jeff Gordon, broke it by some four miles per hour. Now, the speed could be a problem. You're going to have to concentrate. You've got to maintain your composure, and you're going to have to be patient. Yes, the new pavement looks very, very smooth, but many drivers here believe today the new racetrack could make this track even tougher to tame. It, it's the same Darlington. It's, it's uh, blacker than it was, I guess. <laughs> uh, about the only thing different is the surface. Uh, they didn't change any of the characteristics of the racetrack. Now, the first time I ever ran here, it was scary when you run 145, and I guess it's the same when you run 165. To me, it's not changed much at all. It's different. Yeah, it's 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 different than it was. I wish it, I wish it wasn't repaved right now. I'm I'm running wide open in places that, that you don't run wide open in those spots. Because if you do, I remember it vaguely that you'll crash. From 1968 to 1980, Darlington and the name Pearson were synonymous. David won ten times in that period and put himself at the top of the win list. But would he like the speeds of today? Now that might be a little bit too fast for me. You drive it the same way you did back then. Since 1982, however, the man to beat here at Darlington has been Dale Earnhardt. He's racked up nine wins and today could tie Pearson's mark. And as you get a look at that black GM Goodwrench Chevrolet Monte Carlo of Dale Earnhardt. He sits back in the 23rd position, getting strapped into the car. We're just about ready to fire the engines. And Dale, you go after win number 10, trying to tie the Silver Fox. How about it? Well... <laughs> I don't know. You know, he's a tough character, and it's a tough racetrack, so we just want to get through the day. Uh, it'd be great to tie his record, but still, uh, I've always admired David Pearson. He's uh, taught, and I learned a lot from him, so it'd be pretty uh, impressive to be in the same uh, group as the David Pearson, and uh, especially at a racetrack like this, it's tough to take. Well, a lot of people say starting back beyond 20 can be a handicap, but not for Dale Earnhardt, Bob. Well, we've only gotten four races into this season and already three poles and two wins for this young man from Pittsburgh, Indiana, Jeff Gordon. Here's Bill Weber. Well, Jeff Gordon is on the pole sitting in his DuPont Chevrolet, ready to roll out over 170 miles an hour. But Jeff, that's only part of the story. Your teammates are one, two, three. That's an amazing accomplishment. I'm sure you'd like to bring it home that way and that would be your third win. Well, yeah, sure is. I mean, it looks like the guys I'm gonna have to battle are my own teammates, but uh... You know, that's the thing with Hendrick Motorsports. Uh, they build great race cars. They're building great engines right now. And uh, the guys we're really having to worry about are our own people. How about the track, Jeff? How do you like it? Uh, it's great. I mean, it's smooth. It's fast. Uh, you know, it's got a lot more grip than it ever had before. And so that's bringing the speeds way up. Uh, Goodyear's got a great tire for us today. So, you know, I, I think we're going to be in good shape uh, in all areas. We just got to respect this racetrack. Uh, you know, you got to have a lot of respect for it and respect the guys around you. And, Hope that you're there at the end. He's been very fortunate in his career, but this is one track where he hasn't had a lot of success. But 22,000 extra reasons to win today. That's the Unical bonus. Back up to you, Bob. So those are the stories, and we officially welcome you to our first NASCAR Winston Cup race of 1995, the Trans-South Financial 400 from Darlington, South Carolina. I'm Bob Jenkins, and we welcome you back as we continue our coverage of NASCAR Winston Cup racing here on ESPN. We've told you about the stories in the last few minutes and in the previous ha half hour. You know all about them, the top speeds that we've seen turned in here so far and the new pavement. Now, Ned... Jarrett and Benny Parsons have both won at this track. So, gentlemen, the way I read it, with the new pavement and everything, we're not going to see a single yellow here today, and everything's going to go fine, right? Wrong. Wrong. Jenkins, you know better than that. This is Darlington. And I think by listening to the driver's fans, you know that they still respect this place. At 170 miles an hour, this racetrack becomes more narrow than ever before. It's going to be tougher than ever, Ned. Yeah, I think it will be tougher than ever, and, and really the track will be an equalizer. The fastest car don't always win here at Darlington. We've seen it so many times in the past. Will we see it today? Well, we don't know. But we have a big day for you here on ESPN, and Dave Despain can tell us more. 
Hey, the fun starts here, okay? If you don't have a ticket, if you're not in the grandstand, the best place to watch the race is on ESPN and ESPN2. We have 35 cameras, 36 if you count Eileen's little fun saver here. If you get anything good, we want to use that on our television program. 35 cameras, including 21 on the deuce. That's where I'm headed next to do my thing. Stand by for all the excitement of Trans South 400 coming up on two networks. Mark, Mark. ESPN Speed World is being brought to you by Allied Signals Autolite Spark Plugs, guaranteed for two years, no matter how far you go. By the more than 1,000 AutoZone stores across America. AutoZone, the best parts in auto parts. And by Valvoline, the number one choice of America's top mechanics. The cars begin to roll off the grid here at Darlington, and after a couple of warm-up laps, we'll be going green for 400 miles of racing. It's a 1.366-mile oval here at Darlington, 1,228 feet on the front stretch and the back stretch, but notice the corners. Corners 1 and 2 are banked at 25 degrees and are much tighter than turns 3 and 4, which are banked at 23 degrees. As far as the race analysis is concerned here this afternoon, we will go 293 laps. There you see Jeff Gordon's pole speed. The record for the race is 139.9. They should be pitting between laps 60 and 65, and the purse is over a million dollars. The starting lineup for today's race. On the pole is Jeff Gordon at 170.833. Terry Labonte is second. Terry had his first start here in 1979 and his first win in 1980. The second row, there's the third member of the Hendrick team. Kenny Schrader started third alongside the first Ford off Ricky Rudd. And folks, you saw that pit win of 60, 65 laps. That is for fuel, and they will be able to run that far on tires. No problem today. How much did you win by when you won the Southern 500, Ned? Just 14 laps. Close <laughs> finish. I don't think we'll be seeing that kind of a race no. here today. And you can see the new pavement there. Uh, as the cars came off turn four on the inside, you can see where the old pavement started and the new pavement. There we go. We can see on the right side the light color. That's the old pavement. The pit road is still has not been repaved, although there's no reason to pave pit road at 35, 40 miles an hour. What is the pit road speed? Probably 55? 55 miles an hour today. And speaking of pit road, there are 23 drivers that are pitting on the front stretch. The balance of the field is pitting on the back stretch. And he, you are seeing some of those now back in row number 13 and 14. Jeff Bodine and Michael Walter back in row number 14. Jimmy Spencer and Greg Sachs occupy row number 15. Steve Kinzer is in the field without having to uh, take a provisional. Jeremy Mayfield and Billy Standridge back in row 18. We move now to uh, those who had some problems qualifying. The provisional starters are Mast and Marcus and Wallace and Allen, 41st and 42nd. Many in-car cameras. Here's the one on Mark Martin. Now here is Ricky Rutz. We're also in the 16 car of Ted Musgrave. Darrell Walter. There's a face. Look. There's Morgan Shepard in the Citgo Ford getting ready to go. Kenny Schrader will carry a camera. He's right behind the pole center. And Michael Walter has a car or a camera on the top of that car. Here we go green and the Trans South Financial 400 about to get underway and there's the green flag. Hit the wall with the car, and the caution flag is out. Jeff Gordon leads them down to take the caution. Labonte second, Sterling Marlin had moved up to third. 
then Schrader and Rudd as the rest of the field comes down. Nemechek limping to the pit area. Here's a replay of what happened in one. He gets in too high. Just gets in too high, gets the loose stuff, loses the back end of the car. The rear goes around, hits the wall, and that brings the front end hard, Ned. And fortunately, he stays up on the wall because there were a lot of cars behind him coming at full speed, and he stayed up there. They were able to get below him, so no other car involved. It has been a tough early part of the season for Joe Nemechek. That's his brake rotor that's laying on the racetrack on the back stretch. There's Chip Warren as has the thing spotted. He says to the fireman, come pick up this rotor. Here's John Kernan. Well, as Joe Nimitek will take that hard left-hand turn, you see a lot of the damage. Yes, in fact, that was the brake rotor from his car that came off. He is headed to the garage area. We will try to catch up with him momentarily. So Nemechek goes to the garage area. His best finish, by the way, in 1995 has been a 16th at Atlanta. There are the top five, and the second five will be right back. Morgan, this is a piece of a brake rotor. Welcome back to Darlington, South Carolina, the Trans South Financial 400. You're looking at Ricky Rudd, who is, as the other drivers are, standing by to get the green flag and the resumption of this race after a caution caused by Joe Nemechek, who hit the wall between turns one and two. Here's a green. Let's listen. Running in fifth position, there's his, uh, his Ken Schrader just ahead. Back in the pack, uh, it is Ted Musgrave going to the inside of John Andretti, and Brett Bodine does likewise. And we see Jake Griffin with the 15 leg speed in the nine car. There's Earnhardt in the good race Chevrolet. Leg speed trying to get on the inside of Trickle. Can't make the pass. Well, a lot of the drivers were concerned with they be able to pass as fast as they're running here on the new pavement. But we saw yesterday in the Chris race that yes, but one good place to pass here is three and turns three and four as we saw there just a moment ago. And here's Dick Trickle making a pass. He's going to 18th position, dropping Andretti back to 19th. Lake Speed and Dale Earnhardt are right behind him. Now, Rick, uh, Rusty Wallace and Daryl Waltrip are battling together at the front of the field, and Wallace takes the spot away from Daryl. And here comes Bobby Labonte right behind him. And Mark Martin coming right behind, and also Morgan Shepard is coming along, so is Ricky Craven, and with uh, that slight movement up to the top of the racetrack, Waltrip loses several positions. It's kind of like Bristol. You get out of the groove and the train goes by. Or Talladega. Yeah. yeah. There's Morgan Shepard as he looks at the Family Channel car. And a crash up in three and four. Greg Sachs has hit the wall up in three and four. Second caution comes out after just nine laps. It's going to be a long afternoon here at Darlington. Greg Sachs. And the Kendall Pontiac up against the wall in the third turn. He's been able, however, to drive it around the racetrack. But the caution is flying. While we were watching all that other action back in the pack, Sterling Marlin was able to move around Terry Labonte and take over second place. And you can see the damage here to the Pontiac of Greg Sachs. Still able to drive it, though. But it might be just sheet metal on this car. We'll just have to see. He's pitted in the back stretch, so he's headed for his pit, and we'll take another look at what happened. There he comes to the And here's a replay. We can see what happened to Greg Sachs. It looked like he's running pretty well by himself there in the back end, just got out from under him. Well, that's Chuck Bound. That was yeah. behind him, but not too close. No, he's not close enough to hit him. Bill Weber is back there in the Greg Sachs pit. Bill? Well, they're 
working on the Kendall Pontiac. He has heavy left side damage. Obviously, the hood has been up. They're working back around the gas tank. They're gonna have to bend the sheet metal away so they can get the fueler in there. Greg has shut off the engine. They're gonna cut off the rear tail section. This should take a little while. Let's go to John Kearney. Well, the work continues on Joe Nemechek's car. It looks like the most serious part is that broken right front brake rotor. Joe, what happened out there? Well, Darlington's still the same old racetrack. It's pretty tough. Uh, I was in the outside groove, and there isn't a lot of rubber up high yet, and uh, I couldn't get down. Uh, the car got loose going in the corner, just slid up and hit the wall. Uh, tough, tough break for the Burger King Monte Carlo. Uh, we're trying so hard, uh, we just can't seem to get a break yet. Well, they will continue to work, then. He'll be out back on the racetrack just as soon as he can. Meanwhile, the field is still under yellow, however, about to go back to green. Jeff Gordon is the leader of the race. He has led every race so far this year. And in fact, had pulled out to a pretty comfortable interval uh, before the caution came out over Sterling Marlin, who had taken second place. Sachs is back out on the racetrack for the moment as we look at Mark Martin, who is in the 10th position at the moment. Now there is the camera on top of the Budweiser car driven by Ken Schrader. Green is out. We saw Darrell Waltrip get passed by several cars there just before the caution came out. We got a report that his car is very, very loose. He did not make a pit stop. He didn't want to give up that track position. He's going to ride it out. He'll let him make pit stops too. goes to the inside of Schrader and picks up that position. The green car to the inside is Robert Presley. And Ward Bird goes in the corner on the outside of him. We saw what happened to Nemechek. He was <laughs> thin ice. He was very thin ice, but fortunately it held him up. He's just a slight guy. He's, very, he's light, about 130, 140 pounds. So he's... All right, Jerry Punch has more on the Robert Presley story. Guys, 12 days ago, Robert Presley came here to Darlington and ran laps at over 170 miles per hour. Now, when they got ready to qualify the other day, they blew the engine and it got only three laps of practice. And now he moves to East Kenny Schrader and Roy Burton calls him by. But he didn't get a good qualified effort because he had only got three laps of practice. Even with three laps, he qualified in the top ten. He said, if our car runs like it did last week in testing, we will be at the front in the first 35 laps. And he is headed that way right now. Running in fifth position. Positions changing behind him as Ken Schrader is out of the group. Yeah, he got up high. A lot of cars went by him. Father back in the field. Darrell Walter lost another one in about eight or ten positions as he got in the high group, too. So some cars not working too well here, and as a result, they're heading towards the back. We saw Derek Cope in the straight arrow car. There he is, right behind Rusty Wallace. Mark Schrader has moved back in front of Morgan Shepard. Schrader's in the 11th spot right now. And Darrell Waltrip continues to go to the back of the field. But Darrell Waltrip, he used the word patience. He understands this racetrack, and you just can't push it if your car isn't right. You've simply got to back off and wait for a pit stop and make that adjustment. Right, John Kernan? You're exactly right, Benny Parsons. In fact, they are getting up on the wall. His crew ready to go to work. We expect Darrell to come onto pit road next time by. The stop Robert, sign is hey, out. Darrell has oh, been on the radio. The and you look. That was a spotter telling that Darrell Walton's coming on pit road. Here's John. It'll be a four-tire change. What Darrell has been telling his crew, he thinks he possibly has a flat tire, a tire going down. So not taking any chances, they will change all four tires. Going through turns three and four now. He's been by us one. Watch your pit lane speed. The spotters constantly remind your driver to watch that pit lane speed, which is 55 miles an hour. And he's going to lose.
lose a lap as Jeff Gordon two laps actually as Gordon oh, goes by. And Preston spins up in turn one. And he's coming off the racetrack and here comes other cars and Robert Presley. After moving up to fifth and having such a good run in the early going, spins and hits the wall in turn one, but we do not see a caution as Presley continues around the racetrack. He was going down in turn one all by himself, and just like Joe Nemechek, the back end around he went, and we can see the damage as he backs into the wall. We caught the tail end of the crash. Here it is. See, it's already sideways. And the back end, as Benny mentioned, hits the outside wall, but he does come back across the racetrack. Another crash. And this done in turn one and jumped down and hit the wall extremely hard going down in turn one. Bound making his first appearance in a NASCAR Winston Cup event since June of 1994 when he was injured in a crash at Pocono International Raceway in Pennsylvania. And now his race has uh, been affected by this incident. The car is stopped between turns one and two, and for the third time this afternoon, the caution is out. Tough break for Darrell Waltrip because he made that pit stop on green flag and lost a couple of laps. Now it'll be interesting to see if others come in. And you can see the black mark of Chuck Bound's car. The right front tire is flat, Ned. You see the like left front is sliding. That's the black mark, and the right side is flat. That's why that it doesn't leave that distinctive black mark. We see him moving around in there. Let's hope he's okay. Here is the replay. And we can see that something has happened to the car. The right front's flat, and in the wall he goes, and Jerry Punch. As you watch that debris go up in the air, what happened right in front of us? I was standing here. Chuck Bound came down the front straight away. I heard a loud boom, followed by a second boom, and began to see sheet metal ripping from beneath the car. The car, the right front tire went down, and he somersaulted up or leaned up against the wall. Pit stop now become the order of the day. You look entirely down pit road and see all the cars on the lead lap are in their pits. Jeff Gordon, our pole center leader. Everyone expected to get four tires. Right side tires are going. Gordon DuPont Chevrolet. Right. They go to the left side. You just got a glimpse. Earnhardt just now getting into his pit. Left side tires on. The four cars down. Carry the body down. It's a race out of the pits. And Gordon, Labonte, and Marlin. One, two, three. And everybody else now coming out as they finish up work on Dale Earnhardt's car. Back with more from Darlington in a moment. Right after today's checkered flag at Darlington, it's year number two of NASCAR Shop Talk. And an F-16 heading over to Bill Elliott, our special guest. I think I'll fly this at home this afternoon. You'll be home in a hurry. Bill Elliott joining us on Shop Talk following today's race. Stay with us. Darrell Walter. Welcome back to Darlington, South Carolina. ESPN's live coverage of the Trans South Financial 400. We're under our third caution of the day, and the most recent one was caused by an incident involving Chuck Bound. Here's Bill Weber. Well, Chuck, we're glad to see you back, but we're not happy to see you here. What happened? Uh, I really wanted to finish this race. I was optimistic, and the car was running pretty good, even though we started way back. But about three-fourths of the way down the front straightaway, the right front tire just exploded like a bomb. I feel sure I run over something, and it just burst it. You're carrying so much speed here, I was on the brake as hard as I could, but it still hit the first turn wall pretty hard. It's just an unfortunate deal, but we're a good race team. We're still looking for sponsorship. We're available. We'll be back. We'll be at Bristol next week. Chuck Bounds, okay. Let's go to John Kernan with Robert Presley. Robert Presley is also okay, but as you can see, his Chevrolet Monte Carlo is uh, backed into the wall pretty severely, fit the rear end down the crew. Charlie Presley and the crew are working on it. Robert has climbed out of the car. And, and Robert, what happened down there? Did you run into uh, something on the track? Yeah, just, you know, we're just riding there. Uh, Charlie and Leo told me, said, you know, we're as fast as the leaders catching them. And I went off in there and uh, I noticed the 10 car checked up there a little bit early and started going high. And so I just rolling on the low side and you know, it felt like just uh, somebody dropped something out there on the track. Car went so fast, I didn't know what happened. Bob? All right, so Presley will wait until repairs are made on his car. Here's a replay once again of Chuck Bounds' incident. Once again, the right front tire goes flat. And look and at this flying up in the air oh, there. Yeah. Maybe that's what he ran over and cut that tire. Could very well have been, Ed. You're right. All right, we will not go green this time around, so we'll take another break and be back with more in just a moment. Stay with us. You won't believe what is happening at Darlington. There are Rusty Wallace and Mark Martin with 
extremely damaged race cars. It happened as the field was coming down for the green. These guys had not even crossed the line yet, and Michael Waltrip slid into them. We'll have to watch the replay to see exactly what happened. Rusty is out of his car. Here is a replay as the cars came down to take the green flag. There you can see Mark Martin is signaling he's okay, so both drivers are in good shape. What in the world happened here? I don't know. It's, you'll see the yellow car come in there. It looks like Mark might have got in the back of the 30 car and turned Michael sideways. I don't know. I, I don't know if... Take another look from another angle. I believe that Mark got in the back of the 30 car Maybe the 30 car of Michael Walter didn't get off to quite as good a start as Mark thought he would or something. And we'll well, maybe take another a, look from the blimp. Yeah, okay. overhead may give us a better perspective here. Now well, we, we couldn't see the contact and what happened, but there is Walter sideways and both Rusty and Mark collected and into the front stretch wall. Bobby and you know, that's the restart. They're, they're probably running 80 or 90 miles an hour when that happened, and we can see the damage to these cars. It's amazing. Well, there are two guys who, uh, of course, like everyone else, have title hopes for this year. Mark Martin, third in the standings, going into this race, 89 behind. And uh, Rusty Wallace had moved up to 11th position Why before this race. That? But, uh, I don't know, it doesn't look Just good for the wheel straight as you can, and we'll look at the toll. You are hoping Michael's talk was true. Find out why they said that. I need to know. It's too soon. Coming in the back pits. Oh, well, we had the pits then. We're wrecked. The tow, I wouldn't worry about. I'd get the car fixed first. Man. Hey, make sure we ain't got too many. I'm just looking at it. Wouldn't raise that hood. No, it isn't too bad. Just get the fenders off. Get, make sure that rear bumper cover ain't gonna fly off. It is. Take it off. Here comes the pace car. I go. my back. Get some tape ready for that back bumper. Somebody needs to be caught here. It looks like there's 50 guys out here. He's talking about the pit road route. Only seven men can go across the wall. That's what Doug did was telling. Here's John Kernan with both Mark and Rusty. Well, Rusty being talked to right now, so we'll uh, switch over here to Mark and. Mark, the only way as I saw that happen, and Rusty, it, it was just a mess. What happened out there? I'm not really sure. They started, they took off, and then slammed the brakes on, and uh, the wreck was on then. I, I really couldn't, you know, all I can tell you is the 30 car was in front of me, and he took off and slammed the brakes on, and I ran in the back of him, and the wreck was on. on. I don't know. Is that what you saw too, Rusty? That's about what I saw. It's just I know the three or four cars looked like I could just stop right in front of Mark, and he had to lock the brakes up and couldn't do nothing with it, and then I tried to get away from everybody, and it was just, just got collected. You know, I went to the bottom and tried to get around when I saw it happening, but that was about it. Mr. racing deal. Now, when you guys were walking back over toward me, you were laughing at each other. What was that all about? He told me he was going to go home and fly his airplane. <laughs> He just, bought, about he just bought himself a new airplane. I said, screw this deal. Let's just go and fly our planes now. I know we can do about it. We worked our rear ends off, and uh, a silly thing happened. You know the back straightaway pit area? There was a couple cars that got out real fast, and that was a bad deal. And uh, bad accident because of it. But hey, hey, we learn, learn something every day. It's, that was it. It's over. Well, it's great to see that they're both OK, Bob. Boy, it must be safer up in the air than it is. Uh, look at the side of Mark Martin's car. It is gone. Wow. I did, did that one time at Rockingham with the right side on. I ripped the roll bars off as well. <laughs> and won the championship. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is from Mark's in car. He seems to provide some uh, unbelievable in-car shots during crashes. That almost uh, compares with his ride at Talladega that he took last May. In any case, Martin and Wallace have crashed here at Darlington. Michael Waltrip has made another pit stop on the backstretch. There is one more go. Left to go. Turn one. At your speed. Telling him okay, that, Michael, you shouldn't have any problems catching them. The field is in turn one. All right, make some tape. 
patches up and have them taped to the toolbox so when we need them, so they don't get all dirty, so they work. And then uh, be ready, Mike. He's still in the lead lap. That was Terry Smith, the spotter, telling that where the field was located down in turn one, said you'll be able to catch him, no problem. All right, now let's take a look at the crash once again with a half a lap until green. They're coming down to take the green, and I don't know who up in front did not get a good start. Yeah, there's some of these cars right there, uh, Ricky Rudd and the four car of Sterling Marlin. Some of those were sort of jammed up in front of Michael Waltrip, and I guess he, he checked up to keep from uh, hitting them, and when he did, Mark Martin was already barreling down on him and, and hit him. Didn't expect him to check up. The most cautions for a 400 mile race here at Darlington five and we have had four already. Here comes the green flag to resume the competition on lap number 35. Make that 34. The green girl on the inside, Mike Wallace. We should mention that the leader of the race is there's contact between Labonte and uh, Morgan Shepard. The leader of the race is Jeremy Mayfield. The very first time he has ever led a NASCAR Winston Cup race, according to our statistics. And there we see Jeff on the inside of Billy Standard in 47. And here's Jeff Bodine. He's in second place. No, he is. Yes, he's in second place. He did not make the pit stop. He didn't make the Jeff trying to go inside of Wallace. Cale Yarber, of course, owns Jeremy Mayfield's car, and Cale Yarber is one of the most successful drivers ever here in the world in the raceway. They've got Mike Wallace on the outside as Morgan Shepard goes in that turn three side by side with him. Mike Wallace is a couple of laps down already. Yeah, he's in 35th now, two laps down. Not over here. Not over here. What does Morgan Shepard do? Looks okay. He evidently, Morgan has made contact with someone. The spotter was telling him that his car is okay. I think it was Bobby Labonte. Billy Standridge for third position. Standridge running third, then Marlin, Labonte, and Rudd. Well, this is a good day in the sun for Billy Standridge. Staying out on the track and getting to run up front here. Didn't make a pit stop, but uh, showing the world that he, he can run well with the with World Wrestling Association as his sponsor. We see Terry Labonte, the Kellogg's car, down on the inside of Stanbridge. Mm. That makes me nervous here. You notice that, don't you? And when the car is behind, see Stanbridge or whoever go to that uh, upper lane, they just dive to the bottom and go around also. I think Ned Jared is right. It's almost like Talladega. And we see the Hardy's car of Ward Burton behind Morgan Shepard. Dale Jarrett to the inside of Ken Schrader. Well, I held my breath there, too, because he passed, <laughs> he passed uh, Ricky Craven going into turn three and then passed Schrader coming out of turn four. Craven trying to work around Schrader. Back to the lead. Jeremy Mayfield still leading this thing, and Jeff put on his second. Now, Jeff Gordon, our post has caught this duel, but Ned, that tells us that the tire today is a very good tire. Jeremy Mayfield still competitive. After 39 laps, they're completing 40 laps right now, and so, yes, the speed is holding up good. That's what all the drivers said when they came down here and tested. said, fans, you're not going to believe how those speeds will stay up, not like in the past. After about 10 laps, it'd fall off about a second or second and a half a lap. Holding the speed good. Two Fords up front. Gordon, Chevy in third. Well, one of the rare times that Ford's been leading this year. <laughs> Jeff Bodine looking for the opportunity to get into the lead. Dale Earnhardt, meanwhile, is moving up through some traffic back in the pack. Todd Bodine will be the next that he will try to pass. Oh, there's a Jeff Bodine takes the lead, the Exide battery car, and that's the first Bodine to lead a lap this year in NASCAR Winston Cup competition. If he does indeed lead when he gets back here to the start finish line, which it looks like he will, that's where it counts. And Jeff Gordon is taking over that second spot. 
and he has. When Jeff and I cross that white line, he's credited with leading the lap. Yeah, the, the laps are scored just out of the fourth corner where the scorers are, so that's where the five points are awarded. Now the bottle, back to the caution flag and all that stuff is judged at the start-finish line, but not leading the lap. See how Dale Earnhardt is doing. He's back in 16th position. Once following Todd Bodine. Up front, Jeff Gordon puts a little pressure on Jeff Bodine. And we're also seeing some pressure applied to Jeremy Mayfield by Sterling Marlin back there. to the bottom of the racetrack. Oh, no, nope, decided against it. Yeah, he figured he's going to have too much speed to be that low on the racetrack coming off the of turn four, and that was not going to be smart. Here are Todd Bodine and Dale Earnhardt moving around Ricky Craven in the fourth turn. And there's Elliott. It looks like Craven might have a problem. Indeed. He has dropped a lot of positions in the last four or five laps. And here now is Sterling Marlin to the inside. Can he make it? No! Yes! Wow! He forced Mayfield out of position just enough going into the third turn that he was able to take over the spot. So now it's Gordon trying still to take the lead away from Jeff Bodine. As Sterling Marlin has moved to third with Mayfield fourth and Terry Labonte fifth after 44, 293 laps. It's just a matter of time until Gordon can take over the spot, but Jeff is doing a great job holding him off. So that's the way it is right now. We're going to take a break and see how it is in a minute or two when you rejoin us at Darlington International Raceway. Well, a nice job by Jeff Bodine of holding off Jeff Gordon as long as he could, but Gordon has passed him and gone into the lead, and now Sterling Marlin is right on the rear bumper of that number seven car. We see that Jeff Gordon pulled away three or four car lengths just in one lap, as here comes Sterling Marlin on the inside. Oh, and he and Jeff Bodine make contact. Woo! Sterling Marlin pulled up just a little too soon. They made contact, and both of them almost spun out. Here's Bill Weber with more on Jeff Bodine. Well, this team is thrilled with their performance so far. From 27 to 7 in just 40 laps, they only took two tires on a pit stop to do that, but they could use something to lift their spirits. In the last month, they lost a couple of crew men. They had one of the administrators leave. The other day, they had a mechanic working on their car. A wrench slipped. He had to get five stitches to close the gash above his right eye. But right now, they're very happy with the way they're running, and they'd like to hang on. Of course, they're at a disadvantage. They're pitting on the backstretch here at Darlington. Continues to hang on to third at the moment, but Terry Labonte is right there now. You see the hood on Labonte's car moving around. It's, uh, it's like he's got a vibration or something on that car. Talk about Labonte. Here's the Labonte that's moving up through the pack is Bobby Labonte. He is now being shown in the eighth position. He came out of the pits in about... 12th or 13th, and he has moved up this pack. Also here, uh, Jeremy Mayfield, of course, in the 98, and Ward Burton in 31. There you see that Lamonti started 11th, and his progress up to 8th position. Bobby has uh, sort of been battling the flu the last several days. He was pretty feeling real bad yesterday, but uh, he's doing a good job here today. And there is Dale Jarrett, who is in 11th position after starting back in 26th. So things going well for Dale Jarrett. There are the statistics on him. Dropped back to 27th at the end of 10 laps, and then has uh, moved up to 11th. Dale had a, had a poor qualifying effort. And uh, as a result, had to, qualify, had to pit on the backstretch. But on that yellow flag pissed off when everybody stopped. He picked up about five positions on some of those that were pitting on the front 
pace check. So it's not as bad as it used to now that they speed the pace car up after they drop off those spinning on the front stretch. John Kernan is with Ricky Craven. Ricky has won three of the last four Rookie of the Race awards, but uh, Ricky are here in the garage area today and they're working on the engine. Is that the problem? Yeah, you know, we dropped the cylinder or worse. I'm not sure. Kodiak Chevrolet uh, team has been working so hard and I feel bad for them. You know, they deserve they deserve better than this, but we uh, took it on the chin today. We'll go to Bristol. Bob? So Craven, another victim, not necessarily of a crash, but he, too, is in the garage area. Crew chief on board with that team. Rick Wren is uh, crew chief now in the Cody Air Force. Have you seen Ricky Rudd? Jerry, come on. Oh, my goodness. There's kids are in the middle of a sandwich between Todd Bodine and Ken Schrader. And an Dick Trickle. An excellent decision by Steve to back out. Yes, it was. Here's Jerry. And Kenny Schrader has been complaining that he has gotten a vibration in the Budweiser Chevrolet that's gotten considerably worse. That's why he has backed out and has now dropped out of the top 10 and running back in 14th position. He rides high on the racetrack and you see Todd Bodine make a move beneath him in the car number 75 and Dick Trickle will follow him through. Kenny Schrader once again complaining of a vibration. Ken House and we hope it's just an equalized tire and not something in the engine. Back upstairs. All right. You know, the Hendrick cars have been complaining then of vibrations. Jeff Gordon, the both races that he's won this year, both times he complained of a vibration. And a, lot, a little bit ago, I saw the hood on the five car really dancing around. And now it doesn't look that way. I don't think it was there a while ago, but the five, the hood was just dancing like it had a vibration as well. It yeah, could have been now. Could have been the fact that it was running close to another car at that time. It could have been the air off of it that was causing that, but you're right. Uh, Jeff Gordon has definitely had the vibration program problem in some races. It hasn't affected his running, or certainly not affected the winning, but it's something that you, you try to get a handle on, and certainly they've looked, but just haven't been able to find it. Right behind Terry Labonte is a group of cars. Ricky Rudd leading them. Derek Cope is there, also with Bobby Labonte and Ward Burton. That's fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Looking out the back of Ricky Rudd's car. Derek Cope. Almost a two second lead for Jeff Gordon over Sterling Marlin and a six and a half second lead over Ricky Rudd, who was running in fifth as Rudd passes by Loy Allen in the 27 car. And we can see that Derek Cope is parted behind the Loy Allen car. Look as Rudd is just driving away and the three abreast behind him. They're splitting Loy Allen as Ward goes to the outside, Bobby to the inside, and now Morgan Shepard goes high around Loy Allen in turn three. And Dale Jarrett tries to get by the 98 car, Jeremy Mayfield. Well, this racetrack is so difficult when you put traffic out there. It's not, and it's not easy by this by yourself out here on Friday. 15 cars hit the wall in practice and qualifying. 15 cars. Yeah, the new pavement has certainly not changed her in terms of being cantankerous because she has already claimed several victims today and we've got 232 laps to go in this race as we show you an auto light field summary where everyone is running at the present time. All those cars still in the lead lap. As a matter of fact, right now there's 31 cars still in the lead lap. back with our live coverage here at Darlington in a moment. Jeff Gordon is leading at the moment over Sterling Marlin. Stay with us. ESPN Speed World from Darlington, South Carolina being brought to you by Chevrolet. One car company has won more races in the history of NASCAR, genuine Chevrolet. By Firestone, America's tire since 1900. And by McDonald's. Have you had your break today?
just couldn't ask for a more beautiful day, but not for Jeremy Mayfield as he scrapes the wall at three. And NASCAR's looking, they still haven't thrown the caution flag. Oh, and Todd Bodine about crashes and come off turn four. Nice save by Todd as he took evasive action getting around Mayfield. Now Jeremy drops to the inside of the track and that's where he should be. No problem. So after leading and after running up front for so long, Mayfield had begun to drop back and now scrapes the wall drives to his pit. Here's a replay. Well, Dale Earnhardt was trying to pass him for the last several laps. So let's see if Mayfield just gets loose as Earnhardt comes up on him. There goes Dale Jarrett on the inside as Mayfield stays up against the wall. And, uh, and here we see Todd Bodine. Watch to Todd Bodine as he tries to turn away from Dick Trickle and about spun out. Yep. They were all trying to dodge the slowing car of Jeremy Mayfield. There we see trying to get the jack under the car. Bill Weber. Examination needed on the RCA. She's on fire. Oh, we have a fire under the right front of yeah. the car. The brake fluid is caught on fire. The tire's on fire. Bill, what's going on? What? They're kicking out the brake rotors. They've got a fire extinguisher over there. They've extinguished the flames. Now the crew looking underneath, and obviously a lengthy stop. Very disappointing. Fire is out, and uh, the day may be short for Jeremy Mayfield. Meanwhile, back out on the racetrack, the ninth and 10th place runners are Dale Jarrett and Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt had passed Dale a number of laps ago, and then here comes Dale back by Dale. <laughs> the Dale and Dale show, Ned. Again. <laughs> Dale Jarrett moving up quickly in that Haviland Ford. Started 26th. At lap 25, he was 18th, and now is up to ninth. Bill? Bob, about 20 laps ago, Dale radioed in that the Haviland Ford was just a tick loose. Then he called in just a couple of laps ago, saying it's getting a little looser. That sent Larry McReynolds to work. They're going to add two pounds of air pressure to the left front tire at half around a wedge when he comes in. We will look for that as Earnhardt, meanwhile, sneaks in on Jared a little bit. And they're closing in on Morgan Jeff with the Sitco Ford. And I got to give a call to Ward Burton, the Hardy's car. He's been able to get by Bobby Labonte and Ricky and the crash. He gets together with Kenzer and Bobby Labonte's hand and run. He's crashing in the back straightaway. A uh, three or four car crash. And still, Ricky Rudd is taking hits out there. I believe there are more cars involved. The visibility back there in the back stretch is practically zero and a whole bunch of cars coming down. But I think that the worst of it is over. Oh, man, oh, man. Morgan Shepard, Dale Jarrett, and Dale Earnhardt had to really all get on the brakes and just slow down, but they did uh, make it through, so we're riding with Morgan there right now. Well, Rudd's car is a mess. Yeah, we can see the heavy steam smoke coming out of that car. S Steve Kenzer drives away. Here is a replay. Contact. Ward Burton and, and Kenzer get together. Kenzer turns back across the racetrack, and Ward Burton hits Rudd and turns him directly into the wall. And we see the 18 car spinning now. He hasn't hit anything so far. I don't know how much damage that Labonte will have. He goes down to hit the wall then. He comes off the close. I couldn't tell if the front end got against the wall or not, uh, Benny. But pit stops are taking place right now. Let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. And three of the top four cars are pitting here within a few pits of each other. You're watching the triple split. 24, 4, and 5. The 5 on the bottom of the screen, Kellogg Chevrolet, getting right side tires. Likewise, they've already put right sides on the lead car. 24 of Jeff Gordon, left side tires going on the Kodak Chevrolet. 
of our Daytona 500 winners. It's going to be a race out of the pits as the five is still in. Here's the 24 and the four, and it'll be Gordon first, then Marlon, and now Terry Labonte, 23.8 seconds. Labonte having a little bit of trouble with the left side tires. Here's John Kurt in the back pits. Derek Cope leaves his pit stall after a four-tire change. This was a caution period that they really needed. We had noticed Derek, after running in the top ten, had started drifting backwards. His car had gotten very, very loose, so they changed four tires, sticker tires, and they added one round of fight. Let's go to the back stretch now and Bill Weber. Jeff Bodine is coming on. It was four tires for the XI Ford. Now they're working on the Haviland Ford. They've already added a round of wedge. The right side tires are on. The fuel is in, tightening the lug nuts on the left side. The jack is down. Dale Sherrick back trying to gain value position out of the pits. Here on the front stretch, meanwhile, Bobby Labonte is in. Doesn't look like, Benny, there's any damage on that car, but he sure tore up the tires. There's some damage on the right rear of the car. John, is there damage yep. on the right side? Benny, on the right side of the car, I can't see. I'm on the left side. You can see that better, but from the left side, things look all right. Jimmy Maycar is telling them the only thing Bobby mentioned on his way to pit road was that he had spun and blown the tires. I can see some of the crew members working in that left, or the right front tire and they're uh, pulling the sheet metal away so it looks like or sheet metal damage for Bobby Labonte as he pulls away. We'll have to check and see if maybe something like the toe end had been knocked out. Well he was in for over 46 seconds while they assessed the damage to that. Let's take a look at this incident again which occurred as the cars came off of corner two. What happened Steve Kenzer has moved over to let these guys go by and Ward Burton you know was anxious he wanted to get by Steve Kenzer he goes to the inside they make contact and Burton hits a 10 car, knocks him in the wall. And I think the 18 Ned just blew some tires as he spun and trying to get back to the pits. The tires did all the damage. Yeah, I think that was the, the problem with him. And as a result, Bobby Labonte lost a lap when he came in for his pit stop. Ricky Rudd thought he was through there. Wow, pretty hard mix there on the, on the inside. He thought at one time he was through that, and then a car spun and hit him from the inside and shot him right around. And Labonte is back on pit road as Ricky Rudd stays in his car while it is hauled back to the garage area in pitiful shape. We'll be back in just a moment to Darlington. Providing the overhead shots for us today here at Darlington, the Family Channel Blimp. Currently in the area as part of its 95 nationwide tour dedicated to promoting the power of family by using the blimp to support charitable organizations involved with special needs of children and families. That is the view that it has over the racetrack. Here's Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, we're continuing on the front of the Hardy Chevrolet, or what's left of the front of the Chevrolet. Ward Burton has worked his way into the top five, and Ward, a moment ago, we saw some contact between you and Kinzer. What happened? Kinzer probably thought I was up above him. Uh, of course, he's a lap car, and um, uh, we got in there side by side and coming out the corner full throttle, and I think he pulled down a little bit. I know he's trying to learn, but which heck of a way to go out running the top five, but hopefully we'll be back next week. Well, they're going to try to fix it today. What the noise you hear in the background are the hydraulic chisels as they cut away some of the sheet metal of this hardy Chevrolet. His chance at a victory is over, but they hope to get out and finish the race and accumulate some valuable points. This is our fifth caution period of the day, tying a record for the most in a 400-mile race here at Darlington, established back in 1967 and last year in 94. We'll be right back. Remain under caution here at Darlington. We'll show you a Fram field summary as the pace car still has the field in tow. They were going to go green this time around, but it has been waved off. So we'll go at least one more time before we get the green flag. One of the NASCAR safety trucks down on pit road entering uh, where you enter pit road on turn four. See him there with the light going. So that's the situation they need to rectify. And Bill Weber was with Larry McReynolds. 
Barrett made an extra pit stop. Larry McReynolds, how's the Ford? Well, it was really good. We worked our way up to about seventh place, you know. I, I think us in the seven car showed it. Hitting back here necessarily in the disadvantage. But in that wreck, we ran over some debris and blowed the right front tire. Finally, it disintegrated, just tore part of the fender away. We just wanted to make sure the fender was right. And they did that work. The wreck he's talking about involved Ricky Rudd, and he's with John Kernan. Well, Ricky Rudd has climbed from the tide forward, and Ricky, a lot of damage to the car. Uh, what happened out there, and are you going to be able to get back out? Well, I don't think so. It doesn't look like it. It uh, busted the engine. It hit so hard, and, uh, you know, it's just a shame. Uh, Darlington, it's new pavement. It's very fast, but I guess a lot of guys out there are, are not used to running Darlington, and uh, they're not driving Darlington and using the sense they're supposed to, and that's why we're seeing these nonsense-type wrecks today. Well, Ricky Rudd is behind the wall. One car that is rejoining it is Rusty Wallace. Guys, unbelievably, he just pulled back out onto the racetrack. Yeah, he was involved in this crash here on the front stretch with Mark Martin, but they have a sufficient amount of tape on that car to put it back out there. As we watch Michael Waltrip get set. He was in that wreck with Rusty Wallace, and uh, he's still in the lead lap. Uh, was able to get his car going. He's Go, 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 go. Spotter telling Michael Walter the green is out. Go, 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 go. Be careful. But be careful. He can act safe. Gordon and Martin have just taken off from the rest of the field. Well, they did get a big lead on that side. Morgan Shepard looks at Dale Earnhardt as he comes off the second corner. Earnhardt is fifth, Shepard sixth. Bobby Labonte is right behind them, but Bobby did lose the lap. He, he didn't get back to the pits. The, the pace car was coming off the turn four as he was coming into the pits. So he lost the lap, but he had flat tires and couldn't go on around. He made several pit stops to check out that car during the caution and is a lap down in 25th. Waltrip on the high side of Billy Standridge and Jeff Nine also. Steve Kinzer is still out on the racetrack. He was involved in that incident that uh, took Ricky Rudd out of the race. Here's a pack of cars. There's Dick Trickle, Derek Cole, Davy Jones in the white 77. Bill Elliott. Yes, that's Elliott in the red car. John Andretti in the white 37. Tom Bodine. Boy, a lot of close racing. This is about uh, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh, a crash going up the second corner. Well, Jeff Burton is involved in this one. A couple of cars are going to involved in it. Maybe Spencer is involved in it. Lake Speed. Yeah, Lake 28 Speed. is yeah. involved in it. Well, this is a crash vest. Not a whole lot of damage. No by him for it. This is Darlington. <laughs> this is vintage. Oh, they're still cranked. <laughs> okay, the track will be clear when you get back around clear. Listening to Michael Waltrip again. There's a damage on the Haviland Ford. Looks pretty significant, Ned. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty serious damage there. And that's one of the problems when they had the problem there before and got way back in, in the pack. As Larry McReynolds said, they worked their place up, actually, to work their way up to sixth place. But uh, as they come off of turn two, we're going to see Jimmy Spencer move on the inside of is that Jeff Burton, I believe. Jeff, Jeff Burton. Burton, yeah, okay. And then Dale Jarrett and Lake Speed moved down to try to go around them, and they made contact. And so is that Michael Walter going through he there? He went right through the middle, Ooh. just like a field goal. Boy, that was close. Three points for Michael because he <laughs> went right through the middle. No, Bob, this really is vintage dog. Yeah, yeah. This is like Darlington. It's always I was going to say, we haven't right. seen this kind of crashing, though, for several years. Well, here. that, here's another replay, isn't it? Coming off the corner, and we see Dale Jarrett and Lake Speed together. And watch Michael Walter as they're spinning. Zap right through the middle. Just open right up for it. And Bobby Hamilton. Oh, yeah. Bobby Hamilton also did a good job of evasive driving there. To I just heard Doug Hewitt on the radio say they're going to. I don't want to spend to... all day taking it off. So. Well, Doug, just remember it. It's aerodynamically. It won't make a shit if it ain't on there. So. Last thing we wanted to do is get black flagged over it. There he is. 
He talked about changing the air pressure half pound. I heard him just. Just remember, nobody else can go over except for who's over there. So when you're done, Rambo, put your tire in yourself there, and you take that flap off. Michael Walters in the pits, making a pit stop. The 28 car has been black flagged. He is headed toward his pit on the back stretch. He was just trying to catch up to the field as well as he could before he came in. Jeff Burton and Lake Speed, who were also involved in that crash, are on pit road. Burton begins to move away here on the front stretch as we watch Michael and others pit on the back stretch. Now here it is from Michael's perspective. This ought to be good. And the water's just parted and he just Man. drove right through. That was lucky for Michael Waltrip. He still sits Third in his pit area, however, in the back stretch. He'll be back in a moment. Right after today's checkered flag at Darlington, it's year number two of NASCAR Shop Talk. And an F-16 heading over to Bill Elliott, our special guest. I think I'll fly this at home this afternoon. You'll be home in a hurry. Bill Elliott joining us on Shop Talk following today's race. Stay with us. 90 laps completed, and Jeff Gordon leads his Trans-South Financial 400. Sterling Marlin second, then Terry Labonte, Jeff Bodine, and Dale Earnhardt. Running 6 through 10, Morgan Shepard, Steve Grissom, Kyle Petty, Ted Musgrave, and Dick Trickle. Ted Musgrave uh, there in ninth, and Joe Nemechek is back in the race, we will tell you. But let's take a look at what happened just a few laps ago in turn two. Big wreck, big, big, big wreck. That's what happened coming off turn two as Jimmy Spencer and Jeff Burton get together. There they start spinning. And Dale Jarrett and Lake Speed get together trying to dodge the wreck. There's so much smoke that you really can't decide where to go. And Michael and Walter and others were just lucky to point their cars in the right direction. Here's another angle as once again. Very right side of the screen. There the crash starts. There we see Jared and Speed get together. John Kernan is down in the pit area. John? Updating you on Jeff Burton and Lake Speed. First of all, Lake Speed is back in the garage. They're going to have to put a brake rotor on the car. He has no brakes. Donnie Richardson and the crew just sent Jeff Burton back out onto the track. He has the hinge on the rear deck lid has broken, so they've had to strap that down. His car is also bent, twisted in a number of different shapes, but he is back out there on the racetrack. Now let's check in with Bill Weber on the backstretch. Heavy damage for Dale Jarrett. They've removed the hood. They're taking off the front clip. There's a hole in the radiator. The radiator hose is broken. Heavy sheet metal work being done. Let's go to Jerry Conch. Meanwhile, back up front, they're playing Let's Make a Deal. Now, Tony Glover, Sterling Marlin's crew chief, came down to the Gordon pit and asked Ray Everham, hey, we, you and I have the best cars out here. Now, we can run ourselves into the ground, but if you'll let us lead a lap and get five bonus points, we'll fall back behind you. Gordon apparently agreed, so we're going to take the green flag, watch it a couple laps, and see if the four car goes by to lead one lap. Bob? Bobby Labonte trying to get uh, a lap back. Bobby Labonte because if Gordon does let the four car by, that would help Bobby Labonte. I thought I saw some damage on the 24 car when we go to the left front, but I, uh, I don't see anything there. Dave Mark, the 71 car, with Terramai sponsor this week, off the pace, slow down in three and four. He was on the lead lap, by the way. I guess that's the back pits, actually. Yep. Well, Gordon continues to lead. Hasn't let Sterling Marlin go yet. Well, Sterling hadn't got up there. He's closing up the challenge. He's got to catch it first, then, isn't he? Right. Here's Ken Schrader, Derek Cope, Bobby Hamilton. They're back in 15th, 16th, and 17th, and another wreck. And Terry Labonte saved that car. He came off the wall, and how in the world? But Jeff Bonine, heavy damage to the front of his car as he heads towards the pit. There he is going toward the pit. How in the world man, did Labonte save that car? I don't know. He, he made a run on Jeff coming off of turn four, we'll see, in a replay, and was dipping down on the inside of him. And they were battling, they got together. battling for uh, the third position when that occurred. Here it is. Okay, we'll see that Terry has a good run. Jeff goes up a little bit. Terry jumps 
down on the inside. They make contact at the rear. Bodine goes into the wall, and Terry gets it completely sideways, but yet saves it. That was unbelievable. It was. And what happened is little Bonnie went in and just lost the back end, and when he saved it. And well, hey, we don't have a caution, folks, but uh, <laughs> Jeff Bodine's in the pits, and Bill Weber's there. Ford tire change, right side, right front damage to the X-side Ford. Also damage on the left front. They're pulling the sheet metal away from all four tires working extra hard on the right front tire. Now they're going to take some tools over there. We've got another caution on the front stretch. Back upstairs. And now Labonte does wreck here on the front stretch. He's going to help his brother. Bobby Labonte is still out in front of Jeff Gordon, and so he's going to get back in the lead lap. There's Labonte's car to the inside of the racetrack, and here comes his brother leading them down to get his lap back. And another caution flag, the sixth of the day. Terry Labonte, meanwhile, drives off in the Kellogg's number five. Wow. I hope you don't have an airplane to catch too soon after this. Man, I will. No, sir. No, sir. -ree. I'll be right here till this is over. <laughs> Wouldn't miss it. Man. The slowest 400 mile race, by the way, 124.4. Here is uh, Labonte's crash. That's what's left of it. He's just bumped him off the fourth corner. I didn't. I don't know what happened. Uh, he told his crew something broke on the race car. Anyway, the slowest race in 400 miler here at Darlington, 124.4, and the average speed right now is 111.6. We cannot. He cannot get back to the front pits. He's yeah. trying to get back to the pits so he can work on the car, and we can see he's bailing out of the thing. Yeah, this is over off the back stretch, over off turn two in the back stretch. So Terry Labonte has been eliminated from contention here today as the contenders go by the race side. <laughs> Just a beautiful spring day here and an enthusiastic crowd watching the Trans South Financial 400, which has been filled with crashes. Wow. And a little bit of activity above the racetrack, too, huh? He doesn't have a motor. <laughs> And there is the blimp shot overhead of Darlington. And John Kernan is with uh, Terry Labonte, John. Terry just climbed out of his car. And Terry, the first question, I saw you come out of turn four the first time. How did you save it the first time? I don't know. Something broke on it. And I, I thought I just got loose and lost it. And uh, something, I guess, broke. So I s slowed down there and, and started running again. I tried to run hard again and did the same thing. So uh, I don't know what it was. But he has climbed out of the car okay. Now they're going to put a new rear end and some other things. What, are, what all are you going to change on the car to try and get it back out? Uh, yeah, it, it, it tore up an awful lot on it. Ed, you, can, you can just hear the disappointment and feel the disappointment emanating from Terry Labonte down here as Gary Dehart uh, and the crew will go to work and try and get the car repaired and back out on the track. Labonte fourth in points had registered three top ten finishes in 1995. Well, coming up after our coverage of this race, Bill Elliott is the featured guest on Shop Talk with uh, your host, Eli Gold. That's coming up next right after our coverage of the Trans South Financial 400. Pace car heads for the pit area. There is Bill Elliott in the 94 car. He's running in eighth position as we're about to go back to racing. It's still Jeff Gordon up front with Sterling Marlin second and Dale Earnhardt third. Morgan Shepard is fourth. And in the fifth position, it's Steve Grissom. In the 22 car, Randy LaJoy in BNA credit card on the inside. He is one lap down. We'll try to get it back right here. And we see the sixth place car is Kyle Petty. and that's uh, 
Ted Musgrave right behind. Musgrave crashed here Friday in practice, but they're ready to repair the car the same car he crashed. And Barry looks back at Bill Elliott, who we talked about when we on Chop Talk next. Reinhardt has moved around the Sterling Marlin car and has taken over second position. Chevy's Morgan Shepard in fifth at a Ford. And there's a sixth place car and the seventh place car. We're looking out of the back of the sixth place car at the seventh place car of Steve Grissom. First three are Chevy's, Bob. The yeah. Morgan Shepard is fourth in a, in a Ford. And then another Chevrolet of Steve Grissom. Car don't seem to be running quite as good as it did earlier because Earnhardt passed it and has driven away from him. Up through there, and as torn up as it is, Michael Walters is still running pretty well. He is on the lead lap in 15th, uh, just lost 15th position to Bobby Labonte. And here is Morgan Shepard now closing in on Sterling Marlin for third place. Ned, you're right, the four car just doesn't have the speed it had a moment ago. No, I don't know if he's picked up the first or something here, or if the car has gotten loose. It just seems to be. The car is not handling quite as well as it did before. Now Morgan tries to go down on the inside of him, but he thinks better of it coming off the turn four. Kyle Petty closing in on Morgan rather quickly, and now Kyle shoots to the inside as they head for one, but will fall back in line. Yeah, he said, I've been driving too smart. I better not do that today. That wouldn't be smart. Ted Musgrave behind Kyle Petty. Second lead that Gordon has over Kyle in fifth and just a little over a second advantage over Earnhardt. You see Steve Kinder on the inside, the Quaker State car, slow on the inside, going to the back pits. Looks like his stage could be over. Yes, there's Ted. He's smoked out of Kinder's car. Jerry Punch has more on Sterling Marlin. Jerry? Well, apparently a moment ago, Sterling radioed his crew chief, Tony Glover, and complained that the car has suddenly gotten very, very loose. And uh, Tony said, we've got to be patient. Just back out, and we'll save the race car as he has lost the positions. Now, there. Morgan Shepard goes by Sterling Marlin. Marlin continues to drop off, but he can't do much with a very loose race car. Just the opposite situation has occurred with the Dale Earnhardt car. On their previous pit stop, they put two pounds of air in the right front, lowered the track bar. They had been loose, and now that car is wired to the racetrack, and Earnhardt is on a mission. Bob? Yeah, he's gaining on Jeff Gordon right now. It's the first car we've seen today that's, that's done any gaining on that 24 car, but Earnhardt is definitely gaining. Morgan Shepard's movement up to fourth position from the 16th place start. Pretty good run for Morgan. Top four at the moment. This is turn three. Now they're coming off turn four. Here's the Carlton Raceway in front of the front grandstand. Ken Schrader having a tough weekend after a third place start. Rick Mast and Derek Cope. 11, 12, and 13. Speaking of rough weekends, Rick Mast has not had the best of his career. He took a provisional to get in the 39th position. He spun out twice in practice, once uh, both on Friday, I guess. No, once Saturday morning, once Friday, once Saturday morning. But it looks like the car is running pretty well. Here comes Cope on the inside, takes a spot away. Cope moves up to 12th. And Bobby Labonte on the inside trying to get alongside John Andretti and does it. And there's Labonte up to 14th. Looks like Labonte is not taking it all from his spin earlier. Here is uh, Bill Elliott. There's a car spinning over in turn two. It looks like Greg Sachs. Sachs, who had wrecked earlier, is back out on the track. Caution is out. Everybody misses him. It's just a one-car accident. Greg Sachs for the second time this afternoon, bringing out the caution. He was one of several that, that well, he, he came back out pretty quick, I guess, after his uh, original wreck. 
but Joe Nemechek has been back out, and uh, also Robert Presley, who wrecked early. Here's another look at it, Benny. Yeah, Greg Sachs, he was by himself and just a slow spin around, and the roof flaps come up, holds the car down, and all the other cars, the spotters alerted them to what was going on. They all slowed and missed Greg Sachs, or just simply a one car accident. It is our eighth caution of the day, however. It comes on lap 113, and it also sets up another series of pit stops. Here come the leaders. Here. Here's John. Third place car, Morgan Shepard, uh, pulls into the pit. The Wood Brothers would go to work. They will do four tires. If you take a look at Jeff Gordon, the leader, Dale Earnhardt, second. Let's go down where to that end, the Jerry Punch. And Gordon and Earnhardt pitting nose to tail on your screen. Gordon on top, Earnhardt in the middle at 21 on the bottom, and they will all get right side and left side tires. Already to the left side on the Earnhardt machine. Shepard is down 20.9 seconds for Morgan Shepard. And Gordon is out 18.8 for Gordon. Earnhardt 19.1. A scamper off the road, it'll be Gordon. Earnhardt and looks to be Sterling Martin. Let's go to Bill. Kyle Petty is in, was running fifth on the track. Just a four tire change in fuel. Kyle's best finish this year with a 10th at Rockingham. This team with a lightning fast pit stop, and they're back on the track. And the tire has come off Rick Maspar here on the back pit. He's lost the left front tire. He's backing the skull for it toward his pit. There are no other cars coming down pit, pit road. Rick Mash without a left front tire, and his disappointing season continues. They're going to have trouble getting the jack underneath the car. And uh, not much more you can say about that. They're going to put a new left front on it, and Rick Mass just sits there and waits for a tire change. When it rains, it pours, Benny. We were just talking about how bad a weekend he's had. Unbelievable. Looks like they've got it on now, and Rick Mass will be rejoining the race. We'll take a break and be back in just a moment to the Trans South Financial 400. There you can see the pit summary. Almost everybody stayed the same except Kyle Petty, who's pitted on the backstretch. He went from fifth back to 13th as the green flag comes out. And we are back to racing at Darlington. Michael Waltrip, however, has moved up to fourth place. And he changed two tires on that pit stop. He's pitted on the back straightaway, but he only changed two tires. The 15 car of Dick Trickle was ninth before the pit. Now he is fifth. Side. <laughs> and the spotter told him low side. That was Morgan Shepard coming up on the low side. And Dick Trickle now coming up there as well. He's got more low side competition. Slow car. He was right. He tried to pass Randy LaJoy going into turn three and, and got, got uh, high in the turn and couldn't get back down. And you can see just how much these drivers depend on a spotter all throughout the race and just how intense, as Ned Jarrett talked about in our pre team our pre show, just how intense the job is for the spotters for every lap they've got to sit there and tell that driver. Please stop exactly. here, Mike. Just hang in there. You're doing good. And not only do they tell the driver what's going on, but they give him some encouragement once again. Pump that boy up. <laughs> and he is doing good after all he's been through today. Bobby Labonte is all the way back to 17th position. He came in, Bob. He made a pit stop, made a good pit stop, and got back out. But then the next lap had to come back in. They made a chassis adjustment on the left rear of the car, and he pulled off with the wrench in it, had to come back out to take the wrench out. So that gave him bad track position. It's David Jones in the 77 car. He's in 21st position, but only a lap down. There are 19 cars still being shown on the lead lap. It's amazing after all we've been through here today. 173 laps to go. Roy Allen, the Hooters car, the number 27 car. Roy took a provisional to get in. Started 42nd.
Trickles total off time track. His second pit stop, which came on lap number 75. The total time, 37.7, reflects the time he gets off the exit well, the time he starts coming in to the time that he gets back on the racetrack and up to speed. Yes. He should be stopping again, as you can see, on lap 131. We're looking back at Dick Trickle from Morgan Jeffers. Sitco in car. Now, I'll be surprised if Dick Trickle stops on lap 131 because it hasn't been that long since they were in the pit. So, we'll see. Musgrave following Ellie's down in turn three. As Bill goes up, Musgrave will try to get under. No. Maybe he thinks that Elliot is running as fast as he as Musgrave needs, Musgrave needs to go. Musgrave still looking to the inside of Bill. Can't get by. Being faster and getting around are two different things. What they say, catching them to pass them is two different things. <laughs> That's right. Especially with a guy like Bill Elliott has uh, a lot of good experience here at Garland. He's won five times on this racetrack. Bill Elliott has. He's won this event twice in the Southern 500 three times. The most recent win in this event was in 1992. But he finally did get by Bill Elliott from the Donald's car. So now Musgrave is sixth, and Elliott is seventh. Bill Elliott's not going to be a hamburger today. He's not going to steal anything. He'll get everything he earns. Right? <laughs> He'll earn everything he gets, I should say. That's right. There's a body camera following the cars off the second floor. Here's a battle between the fourth and fifth place cars, the two forwards of Morgan Shepard and Dick Trickle. They're following Darrell Waltrip. Darrell is a number of laps down, three laps down, as a matter of fact, being shown in 23rd position. He, he made an unscheduled pit stop, a green flag pit stop, I should say. Yeah, it was an unscheduled early in the race. Went two laps down at that time. As you can see, Trickle pulls up right on the rear bumper of Morgan Shepard. I can't believe he's doing this. Move him listening to Morgan Shepard's radio conversation. Telling his crew and spotters, I can't believe that Darrell Walton isn't letting me by. And they said he's three laps down. He should be able to move over and let him go by. You know what he said? Yeah. Look at this. Three abreast down the front stretch. Somebody well, had him back on. Oh, and Kyle Petty went down to the apron. Good move, Kyle. And Michael Walker was the guy that backed off. He still was driving the smart. Suicide. Survival race, and it may yeah. be the best thinking. Yeah, it's good. Very smart. This is another spot to Derek Cope. Cope has been running pretty doggone good today. Yep. And Bobby Labonte still continues to run so well. He's trying to get by Michael Walker. Can't make the pass. It's unbelievable that both Labonte and Wallace are both on the lead lap because they've been through a lot so far today. Walter, not Wallace. Yeah. Walter. That's they're what you mean. They're 12th and 13th. Thank you, Vinny. It's not what I say. It's what I mean. Exactly. <laughs> and you folks, you knew what he meant. <laughs> Hang in there. Here's a Napa field summary. <laughs> Todd Bodine now on the... 30 car. Nineteen cars on the lead lap. John Andretti, Red Boat on, 15th and 16th. Bobby Hamilton also on the lead lap. He's 17th. Rick Mast is still on the lead lap. He's in 18th position.
mention that uh, Junior Johnson's fine has been up to another $5,000. He appealed and they they lowered the fine and then he appealed again. And on the second hearing, he was uh, fined another $5,000. Yeah, they lowered it $10,000 on the first appeal. Yeah. And uh, he appealed it again and then they raised the fine. Right. There's the interval between first and second. Dale Earnhardt is your second place driver as Jeff Gordon continues to lead, looking for his third victory of 1995. ESPN Speed World coverage from Darlington is being brought to you by Cole Filter Miller Genuine Draft, making the world a very cool place, and by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life and by Goodyear, number one in tires. The Trans South Financial 400 is being led by Jeff Gordon, being dominated by Jeff Gordon, as a matter of fact. Although Dale Earnhardt is not too far behind in second position, the 31 car is back on pit road. And we can see the four left just behind Jeff Gordon, the four car pinching Earnhardt quickly. There he went. There's the 31 car, Ward Burton coming back on the racetrack. There's Schrader, Grissom, and the 18 car. Great battle. All of those cars on the same lap, battling for position, 9th, 10th, and 11th. Here's second, about to change as Marlin passes Earnhardt. Now then, does that mean that Sterling Marlin is that fast all of a sudden, or does Earnhardt have a problem? Well, he's, uh, Earnhardt has started losing ground to Jeff Gordon, the leader. He had been running about 10 or 12 car lengths behind him, and now he's uh, more than a second behind him, so I think Earnhardt has slowed a little bit. Ken Schrader running in ninth position. There's 10th, Steve Grissom. Crash over turn three and four. Darrell Waltrip is in the wall over there. We can see the damage to the rear of the Western Auto Car. Slides to a stop at the yeah, we bottom the right of the front tire. Says it busted the right front tire. That's how bad is. I'll be there just a second, and uh, you might need to get a hammer, dude. <laughs> <laughs> And you have to maintain a little bit of a sense of humor there. <laughs> I see he's a great big hammer. <laughs> Maybe a torch and a welder. I mean, I'm not being funny. I mean, this is not funny. I'm sure it, it's not funny to Darrell Walter, this guy. No, it is. The right size, so we'll work on this left side. It is amazing that a man like that can undergo that and still maintain a bit of humor. Anyway, we're under caution again for the ninth time today. Pit Road at the moment is closed. The pace car has not yet picked up. Now it does pick up the field. We made a mistake a while ago. The car, Gary, ought to take to the wind tunnel. We made a mistake when Dick Trickle. The budget cord's at, Tom. I guess it's not. David. Budget cord is just. It's a rubber cord, cord, piece of yeah, rubber cord that goes over and holds the hood down, holds the fenders on, whatever, along with tape. Don't you need a torch? Yeah, they almost do. Anyway, we made a mistake and we showed you that Dick Trickle's next pit stop would come at about lap 30, 132 or whatever. But uh, we're not too far off. It's 140, and here come the leaders of those on the lead lap. Sterling Marlin, Dale Earnhardt, Morgan Shepard, Trickle, Elliott, Schrader, Labonte, Cope, Andretti, and Brett Bodine. And Darrell Walton lost another lap. Jerry Punch. Triple split pit stop, somewhat of a break uh, for Dale Earnhardt. He's on the bottom of your screen. His car had just gotten very, very loose again. He had lost second spot. Now he's on the bottom. He's making air pressure change. And Shepard is out. You see they're going to put a little wedge in the, in the right rear of the three car. Four car and 24 are both out. Left side tires down on Earnhardt. Here's the slowest pit stop, but they made a chance to adjust. Let's go to John Kerr. Jerry, what looked to be a routine four-tire change for Morgan Shepard resulted in that they left a ratchet. They were trying to raise the track bar, and Lynn Wood did 
not get the ratchet out in time. Morgan left. He's going to have to come back in, stop on pit road. So the fourth place car is going to lose a number of positions because they didn't get the ratchet out of the rear. Yeah, actually, it come out in third place. That's too We got to come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See the ratchet sticking up there on the right side of the car. And that adjustment is on the Panhard bar. Go, go, go. Go ahead and quit making some mean adjustments, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck it. This uh, most recent incident from Daryl Waltrip's roof cam. Oh, wow. Whoa, was that close? Boy, now watch Ted Musgrave. Man. It has been an interesting afternoon at Darlington, and we still got quite a few laps to go. We'll be back with more in a moment. Welcome back to Darlington, South Carolina, the Trans South Financial 400, getting set to go back to Reen. A couple of cars have rejoined the race. Chuck Bound and Dale Jarrett. All right, now, you folks watched Earnhardt make that pit stop, and we said he made a chassis adjustment because his car had gotten loose. And you guys that are experts, you saw him turn that wrench down, and you say, no, they were loosed in the car up. Remember in Atlanta when I did the track back on the Panhard bar with the adjustment they have now? What they were adjusting was the Panhard bar, the same thing as the 21 car. And when they tighten that bolt or drive the Panhard bar down, that, in fact, does tighten the car up. Thank you. Jerry Punch has more. And Benny, the reason they were lowering that Pennard bar, a track bar in the rear of Earnhardt's car, as we might mention, his car had gotten loose. Now, earlier on a previous pit stop, they had actually raised the track bar a little bit. They put a little air in the right front tire, then came back and raised the track bar, but that let the car get loose in about 20 laps, so they went back to the original setting and lowered it back to where it was at the start of the race. Bob? Okay, here we go again. Coming off of corner number four, running to take the green flag is Jeff Gordon at the front of the field. The restart comes on lap number 146. Sterling Marlin second, Dale Earnhardt third, and Dick Trickle now fourth. And Derek Cope in fifth. Derek was running 12th before that round of pit stops. He came out in fifth place. Cope is just having a great year. He's ninth in the point stand. Has been up in the top ten all afternoon. Here's the 22 car of LaJoy being passed once again. He was at the front of the field for the restart, trying to get the lap back, but could not. Big break for Bill Elliott because he had a flat tire that was going down. He's able to stop and make the tire change on the caution flag. Morgan Shepard passing John Andretti. He had to come back in, get that reach taken out, so he had to go away back to the back of the pack. Ted Musgrave also going to the inside around John, and Jeff Burton makes it three wide down the front stretch. Jeff Martin was involved in that incident over there with Jimmy Spencer and Dale Jarrett and Blake Speed, but he's still on the lead lap. Marlin is within a car length and a half or so of the leader, Jeff Gordon. Now they might be able to make a deal. He's close enough now to challenge say we need the lead lap. Seven. There's Cope. And 
And that's the separation between Derek and the leaders. John Kernan is with Darrell Walter. Well, work continues in the garage area as Mark Martin tries to make his way out onto the track. We've got Darrell Walter out of the car, and Darrell, only way you can describe this is a rough race, a rough day for you. I knew it was going to be this way. Uh, I didn't know we were going to have all this trouble. We, we uh, self-inflicted some of it. Uh, we just didn't have the car right to start with. We had to work on it, got it good, and then I run over something and cut that tire down and tore it all to pieces. Probably should have quit on the very get-go the way it was going, but... The, my Western Auto boys are working hard, and we'll be back uh, next week. We got Bristol coming up. Thank you, Lord, for not letting me get hurt. That was a pretty hard crash, but I feel okay. Hello, Mom, Dad, and everybody. Daryl Walter still able to maintain a sense of humor despite the rough day he's had. Five wins here at Darlington. Four in this race, one in the Southern 500. Mark Martin's back out on the racetrack. He was being listed in 42nd position, what, 120 some laps down. Because he went out early in the race in a crash here on the front straightaway. But he's back out there to try to make up a few positions. He's missing a few parts, aren't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's not very aerodynamic, is it? Look at this. This. <laughs> <laughs> they just put a piece of sheet metal over there and painted the six on it. <laughs> you remember the whole side of that car was torn away by Rusty Wallace when they collided this on the front stretch. Man, that is so funny. It just goes to show you how important points are. Each position back from about, uh, what, 12th or something on back, or three points per position. And so any position they can pick up, that's an extra few points. And you never know at the end of the year how much that might mean. Could that's mean right. big dollars. Yep. There's been a lot of cars that have had trouble since Mark Martin had that problem with 41 cars out. He can overtake him and several other cars have fallen out. Daryl Walker. Yep. And uh, Terry Labonte is still in the pits, uh, in the garage, is still working on his car, but I don't guess that Mark can get you. Push it, push it, man. John Morgan Jefferson, his car is pushing pretty bad. Bobby Labonte continues to pick him off. He's caught uh, Steve Grissom and Derek Cope. That's the fifth and sixth place cars. That's fifth, sixth, and seventh you're seeing there. Labonte is in seventh. There for him. Oh, Try to drive on the inside. Grissom thought he was going to come as well. Both those cars powered by Hendrick Engines. I was over there last week, Ned, and with Randy Dorton and all the guys. Oh, they got a great operation over there. They really did have. Yeah. And it shows. A couple of guys dropping the tires down onto the apron, but surviving. Todd Bodine, Michael Waltrip, and Morgan Shepard. You know, Ben and I talked about this today. There we see Bobby Labonte goes by Grissom. Takes the, here comes Kyle Petty trying to take his spot away from Grissom as well. That'll put Cotton in the seventh place. And he does it. Ben, you and I talked about at the top of the show how the speed has made the racetrack narrower, more narrow. And I think all these accidents really point that out, that the faster these cars are going, just the more narrow the racetrack does become. Yeah, they're getting so much better grip in the turns, which is, uh, of course, picking the speed up. And they're running when they come out of each turn, whether it's coming out of one into two or three into four, they're running a lot faster than they've been for the last several years. And something's got to happen when you get out there. It all comes up in a hurry. We're watching from overhead in the Family Channel blimp. As Bobby Labonte now comes up on Derek Cope for fifth place. Labonte is having his best run here at Darlington, at least in a 400-mile race. His best finish was 18th back in 1993. I should say the spring race. And through the corners, Labonte just closes right in on the back bumper on Derek Cope. Here is Todd Bodine passing the one car of Rick Mast. And here comes Michael Walter right behind him. Got Rick Mast off the gas just a little bit coming off the second corner. He lost that head of steam. 
11th, 12th, and 13th there. Back up front, it is still Sterling Marlin trailing Jeff Gordon by just a few inches now as Sterling closes up. He trailed it one inch. Yep. Like that. Leaves. Going to. It's the first time today. Yeah. That might be the first time this year Jeff Gordon's been passed. <laughs> it is the second time this year that Sterling Marlin has led. Not since Daytona has he been up front, but he is now. Let's see if Jeff can get him back. Nope. Bobby Labonte continues to put the pressure. Ooh, we got a good four car battle here. Kyle Petty gets up there and passes Labonte. And we got side by side battles everywhere. Here's Musgrave, Mast, and Andretti. John Andretti trying to move up to 15. See if Kyle Petty can shoot around Derry Cope here at the end of the straightaway. Nope. And look at this. Jeff Gordon goes back around Sterling Marlin, and it could have been a situation that we had a report on earlier. Jerry? Bob, that's exactly what it was. Jeff Gordon was allowing Sterling Marlin to go by him and lead one lap, one definite lap. Okay, you've led a lap. He said, I'm going to go back by. So that's exactly what they did. Now they're back where they were with Gordon leading and Marlin in second. So Sterling has picked up the five bonus points, but Jeff says that's enough, and he goes back to the front of this race. Lake Speed just went back out of the garage area, out of the track, and the spam forward. He's uh, 74 laps Four. down. Yep. And Bobby Labonte passes the 42 car of Kyle Petty and moves up to fifth position. So we've got a lot of passing going on here. It's been an exciting race to this point, but Jeff Gordon has been the man for the most part and has run up front, as he does right now. We'll resume our live coverage in just a moment. Bob Jenkins, Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, John Kernan, Bill Weber, and Dr. Jerry Punch back at the Trans-South Financial 400 and the Family Channel Blimp Tour 95 is helping to spread the word about the Family Channel's quality value-based programming and original movies. Network is the nation's viewing choice in family entertainment with 60 million subscribers and they're providing some great overhead shots of our race today also. And now we focus down on the racetrack as the 15 car of Dick Trickle has taken third from Dale Earnhardt and here is how it happened. Going to turn one, Trickle gets on the inside, gets position, and Earnhardt Trickle goes down to the apron literally sure does. to get by Earnhardt. He had almost all four tires down on the apron. Now an on-track interval showing you the difference between first and fourth, the lap times for those. It was 4.2 second interval between first and fourth on lap 163. And on 162, that had... It's unbelievable, man. He's running 29.90, under 30 seconds every lap yep. Jeff Gordon is. Man. Great is fast now. Automotive finishes Chevrolet. It's hard to believe they can still maintain that kind of speed this late in the race. Of course, that's a tribute to the tires and also to to that race car, the same race car that he won with at Rockingham and Atlanta. You know, a little bit, just a little bit ago, the NASCAR official Paul Ford is flagman. Black flag, I think the 28 cars he come down the front straight away. And the 32 car, Chuck Bound was also crashed earlier today. He's alongside the Dale Jarrett. So when Doyle Ford waved the black flag, both of them went to the pit. <laughs> they, they got pushed the price of one. By the way, uh, happy birthday to Doyle Ford, who celebrated his 62nd birthday yesterday. Looking for the 21 car of Morgan Shepard. Here he comes off the corner, just ahead of Michael Waltrip. They were running in 11th and 12th position. Now we saw those speeds on Jeff Gordon there a moment ago. I just had a had a clock watch on Bobby Lamont, and he's running about 29.92. We see him come up in back in the fifth place right now. Gary Cope has lost some positions he, recently. He has lost a position. Not only have evidently cars getting loose, pushing something because 
He's lost three or four spots and he's drifting back towards Kenny Schrader. Yeah, he's in 12th and Schrader's in 13th at the moment. And there's a 14th place car of Ted Musgrave also. Both Schrader and Derek Cope. A little bit of glare there going into the corner, huh? Just going down turn one, drop it into the setting sun, and as the day goes on, it becomes worse. Now Kenny shoots from the inside of Derek. Pass him or try to go it into three. Forces Cope high, but takes the spot, and here comes Musgrave and John Andretti will be looking for the opportunity to do the same. Yes. And here comes Rick Mask on by as well, and Jeff Burton, all these cars. Pass it, Cope, for position. And Cope has ready of the crew and said the car has gotten extremely loose as Musgrave tries to get by Schrader. Looks like he's going to be able to do it. John Andretti's going to try to come through also. So now Ken Schrader loses positions as he's up high. interesting interview you did with him, Benny, on Speed Week uh, that ran Friday night, <laughs> especially his final comment. And he says, if we don't start doing things, we're going to have to make some changes. And I hope he doesn't mean He's speaking the pressure because the other Henry cars, Jeff Gordon and Terry LaBotte, both of them are done. And he hasn't won this year, so he's getting to feel the pressure, and I don't blame him. I think anybody in his shoes would. Body has caught Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt has, has dropped the fourth when Dick Crickle got around him as they go around Loy Allen. Crickle has pulled away from Earnhardt. Now Bobby Labonte wants to take over the fourth position. by the Joe Gibbs shop uh, last week, Ned, and he has a fabulous shop over in Charlotte. Yeah, I was in there a few weeks ago, and it really does. Brand new shop they moved into last winter. John Curtin has more on Bobby Labonte's excellent run here today. You have to give a lot of credit to the determination and the guts of Bobby Labonte. This morning, saw him. He'd been suffering from the flu all weekend. In fact, I think Dr. Jerry Punch had even treated him over the weekend. Bobby told me this morning he was still feeling pretty terrible. In fact, guys, this morning he looked as white as a sheet. He is doing an excellent job hanging in out there. I bet he doesn't have a pain in the world right now. He moves up to fourth, and he's thinking, hey, if I hang this thing together, I can win this race. We'll see right now the one with Doyle Ford waves at the end. That black and white one. Billy Standridge, Kyle Petty, and Todd Bodine are in view now. Standridge is not on the lead lap. But he's hanging in there. He's yep. just having a good run today. He's on the 23rd position. And Todd gets by Kyle. Kyle running behind the, the 47 car. Got Kyle uh, boxed in there and took over the six spot. Strong Kyle Petty. And hey, Kyle, don't look behind you too far because there's Grissom. Great race. And folks, if you want to see the Southern 500, the Mountain Dew Southern 500 Labor Day, I would suggest you order tickets early because they're going fast, I guarantee you. Yeah, after what we've seen here today, I, I would think there's going to be a lot of interest in it. And besides, by that time, we could have somebody going for the Winston Union tomorrow. Yes. So it's still Jeff Gordon that is leading this race. As Dale Earnhardt reports that his car is loose, that's why he's fallen back to fifth spot. Gordon leads over Sterling Marlin, Trickle, Labonte, and Earnhardt. Back in a moment. Back at Darlington pit stop, the order today under caution, 24, 4, and 15. If you're watching all three cars, and they're all down and out almost the same time. A second differential for Jeff Gordon, 18.7. Where's an identical 19.7 time for Marlin and Trickle here pitting under caution for four tires. And Bobby Labonte, what a pit stop Jimmy Maycar and company had for that car right there, the Interstate Batteries Chevrolet, Bob. We are under caution because of an incident involving uh, Loy Allen. Let's go to Bill Weber. Kyle Petty on and off of the road. A four-tire change. Rick Mast is also here. He's on his way out. See Chris and beat them in. They're all racing for position off the back pits. 
Here comes Michael Waltrip. A lot of cars that are pitting on the back stretch are still on the lead lap. Somebody keep an eye out for that water bottle. It comes out of there, he stepped right on it and slipped. So. There is Loy Allen's car. It slid off of corner number four, made contact with the inside wall. Loy is okay, but it does bring out another caution, and that's the tenth one of the day. We are one short of the Trans South 500 record, not 400. Here's how it started from our speed shot. Oh, he was already backwards when he when he came down through there. Slid down to the inside wall, and now they take the hooters forward into the garage. All right, so we get lined up now, but first, new gadgets, new machines, they show up all the time here in Winston Cup Racing. Benny has found one that involves tires. Track facts are brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. Here is Jerry Punch. During the era of the bias plot tire, the critical measurement was tire circumference. When fully inflated, tires could vary up to an inch. That variation came to be known as stagger. Now with the radial tire, the construction provides for a constant or preset circumference. The critical measurement now is tire pressure. Teams realize that fluctuations as slight as one pound can drastically alter the handling characteristics of the tire and the car. So accurate air gauges are critical. No longer can you rely on the garden variety truck stop pencil gauge. Now they use sophisticated oil filled units that are calibrated almost daily. The air pressure adjustments are really changing the flexibility of the sidewall. But until now, there was no way to measure sidewall rigidity. Bill Elliott team manager Gene Roberts designed this machine to do just that. A tire is bolted on and inflated to recommended pressure. The pressure gauge is zeroed to baseline. Then the tire is depressed exactly one half inch hydraulically against a steel platform. Then tire specialist Mike Thomas will make sure that the tire is inflated to the proper pressure. Take a look here. The pressure should be about 48 pounds. Exactly 48. Now he will look at the gauge and determine the arbitrary reading of sidewall flexibility or rigidity. And once the gauge stops fluctuating, it's 2376. Now Thomas will go back and add two pounds of air pressure a slight adjustment, but take a look at what this does to sidewall rigidity. It certainly increases it considerably. And therefore, we have a machine finally to determine the flexibility of a radial tire sidewall. But before you race fans dash out to your nearest tire store to see one of these, be aware. This is a one-of-a-kind machine totally designed, constructed, and owned by the Elliots in Dawsonville, Georgia. And we'll have more on this and the green flag for the reception of the race when we come back. We have been racing for uh, a lap and a half. Jeff Gordon is still up front. Randy LaJoy, who has tried on numerous times to get a lap back, at the moment is at the tail end of the lead lap. But Jeff down his neck, as are Sterling Marlin and Bobby Labonte. We'll watch this as Benny tells us more about that machine. Well, I don't know that I want to tell you more about the machine. Uh-oh, here we go on the outside, and here comes the corker on the inside. But I was talking to some of the mechanics there, and we showed just how much difference it made by putting two pounds of air pressure in the tire, how much stronger it made the tire. When these tires get hot, after four or five laps, they build up to 16 pounds of air pressure above what they start and hold. Wow. So you can see how much difference that the tires get, and that's why the teams are trying to run the tires a little lower on air pressure to take care of the buildup. Yep. Hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh-oh. He's trying to get him. And here comes the race for the lead, and it's the four car. And he and Gordon make contact. And look at Labonte. Oh, my gosh. He came flying up on Gordon and got to the inside and took second. <laughs> I, I believe that Jeff Gordon has spotted Mr. Willis and said, hey, that's 18 car coming in a hurry because he, he was coming almost too fast to stop it if, Bobby had, if Gordon had cut down a little bit there. And so good to get the drive. This is the first time in the race that Jeff has not run either first or second. He's back to third. All the way back to third. Yeah. What will he do? John Kernan has more on Bobby Labonte. Bobby had complained that the car was ill. We've got to spin the 42 car. Kyle Petty is sitting out there. Bill Elliott hit him. Yep, Bill Elliott hit him. And Kyle is bad.
badly damaged in turn three. That's Leonard. too bad. They had a good run going. He was in eighth position. And we see the, all the damage to the rear of the car. And Elliott's car was heavy damage to the right front. And we a fire. Yeah. Fires uh, on the right side. I guess he's just trying to start the car, I guess, and the exhaust pipe, the flame is coming out the exhaust pipe. We see the... Kyle says he got into oil in turn three is the reason the car went around on him. There we see Kyle jumping out. He's trying to undo his radio that he forgot to unhook. <laughs> now he's back in unhooking all that. All right, let's take a look on replay. He's already sideways. And right in the middle of a pack. He goes first up, got through, but here comes Elliot. He hits the right, his right front hits Kyle's front. And I believe that's the only two cars that made contact in the spin. Here's Bill. He tries to get under him. Can't quite make it. Davey Six Jones. inches a foot, yep. maybe. Davy Jones just missed. All right, we have tied the record for number of cautions in a spring race here at Darlington. There's Kyle Petty. He's okay. Back in a moment. Right after today's checkered flag at Darlington, it's year number two of NASCAR Shop Talk. And an F-16 heading over to Bill Elliott, our special guest. I think I'll fly this at home this afternoon. You'll be home in a hurry. Bill Elliott joining us on Shop Talk following today's race. Stay with us. Ironically, Bill Elliott has just been involved in a crash with Kyle Petty that has dropped him a lap down back into 18th position. Kyle Petty continues to run back to his pit area. He's been running since uh, he left the car in turn three. Man, must be in pretty good shape. Must be in pretty good shape. Could be <laughs> by now, wouldn't you? He's waving to us as he goes by. Hi, Kyle. <laughs> the car is a mess. Yeah, it is. Once again, we'll show you what happened. A lot of drivers had reported there was oil on the racetrack, and Kyle found it. He found it, and around he went. There he is, just losing control. The back end goes around. He comes down, and when he goes up, he's going to do some damage to the rear of the car. Now we're going to get to front. There it is, Bill Elliott. From Michael Waltrip's in-car camera, he was right behind it. Fortunately for Michael, there were a couple of cars running side by side in front of him, and he had backed off to keep uh, from running over them, uh, and it might have let him have better control. Let's go to the pits and uh, John Kernan. Well, Bill Elliott's crew getting ready to go to work. Bill has pulled it behind the wall. He has no brakes. Bill, a uh, tough, tough day for you out there. What happened? Well, it looks like somebody dropped oil on the racetrack, and Cal run down in the corner and spun out. You know, it's just a situation that there's so much happening today that, you know, how, you don't know if it's anybody's fault or not, but it's, it's just a tough situation. The racetrack's too fast to race on. And if you have a problem, you're in the middle of a wreck before you know it. We've seen a lot of people back here as they take Kyle Petty's car back to the uh, back pits. A lot of people down here in the garage are echo those same types of sentiments from Bill Elliott. So the new pavement has done a world of good in many ways, but it's made the racetrack a lot faster, and we have seen a lot of cars crash here today because of it. They'll have to learn how to drive this track all over again. We'll be right back. ESPN Speed World is live today at the Trans South Financial 400 in Darlington, South Carolina. Was there oil on the racetrack that resulted uh, in the incident as we look at the family channel blimp that's hovering overhead of this racetrack? Well, here is Daryl Waltrip's roof cam. He would say, yeah, there is. That's Chuck Bowne, I think, that went by him in the 32 car. And look at the oil at that. Yeah, a lot of oil coming on there. So let's go to the back stretch. Bill Weber is standing by with Kyle Petty. Kyle, oil on the racetrack. little bit going in one I went high and I kind of got away from it and the next lap you know you're catching your race and you're trying to do all you can I got in it going in three down there and it just turned around real quick I thought I had it after it run through it it got sideways and it got out and I thought I had it but by then I was so high on the racetrack I was up in the loose stuff and 
packed her in the wall one of them days. You had good lap times. You were having a good run. Took you about 15, 20 laps to get your tires in. Yeah, I'm a junk qualifier. Uh, and I hate this place. And I'll go on record as saying I went it during the bush race yesterday. I said I hate Darlington. Hate Bristol, too. That's coming up next week. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we didn't qualify that good. But we knew once we got in a race, we'd be all right. And, you know, we just pick them off one at a time. And there were some good guys. I tell you, Bobby Labonte is stout right now. I look for him to give him a run up later on in the race. Even with her new coat, you don't like the lady in black? <laughs> I, I've said it before. I think they ought to fill this place up with water to the outside retaining wall, dump bass in it, and have pro bass tournaments in here <laughs> and sell seats in them grandstands right there and let people just watch them fish all day long and be fine with me. But I, I'll tell you this. As bad as this place is, you could stock this thing with a million fish when nobody catch one. <laughs> oh, oh. All right, let's take a look at our Budweiser race recap. Currently, Sterling Marlin has uh, led nine of the first 196 laps. 11 changes for the lead. 11 caution flags for 55 laps, and we're averaging only 117 miles an hour. Those that have picked up the five bonus points for leading include Gordon Mayfield, Marlin, Jeff Bodine, and Jeff Burton. Also, Jimmy Spencer and Michael Waltrip have led at least one lap. And now take a look at the lengthy uh, cars out of the race. Actually, there aren't that many cars officially out of the race, but on the track, we have at least 10 cars that are 50 or more laps down to the leader. So it has been a tough day, and I think if I didn't have a sheet metal shop, Benny, I'd want to own a paint store because they're going to have to repaint the wall here. You know, Rusty Wallace was involved in the accident with uh, Mark Martin, and right now, Rusty Wallace is running 28. He's 57 laps down, but he is running 28. He has picked up 13, 14 spots since he had the action. That's about 40 points. That's yep, right, 40 points. All right, let's go back to green, shall we? Sterling Marlin up front with Bobby Labonte second, and Jeff Gordon is third. The crowd that gathered here early today is still here. Nobody has left. We've got a lot of laps to run. We are back to green. And none of the leaders made a pit stop. Whoa! Bobby Labonte gets in the 22 car and Jeff Gordon. Right in front of Jeff Gordon. Gordon gets the worst of it, I believe. Randy LaJoy, who has been up front on a restart for the last three or four times, spins right in front of Jeff. A lot of damage on the DuPont Chevrolet. He won't win this race today. Nope, the win streak will not go to three, or the number of wins will not be going to three. There is oil on the racetrack again. We it's, are under caution. It's oil or water from Jeff Gordon's car, and there's all the way around the racetrack. So it could have broken uh, an oil cooler line or oil cooler, anything. Yeah. There we see the oil. See it on the bottom of the racetrack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The cars are going through it now. The forces are going at a reduced rate of speed. Here it is again. There we see LaJoy. Starlin Marlin gets by him. And just a little touch from yep. Bobby Labonte sends LaJoy around. And Bobby Labonte might have touched him down just a little bit with the left side of his race car, but... He certainly didn't hurt. have the damage that Jeff Gordon had. Here it is from the blimp. Definite contact between yep. LaJoy and Bobby Labonte, and yet Labonte did take a hit in the left uh, quarter panel. He's coming into the pits right now, and of course Jeff Gordon is the one that really took the hit. Yep because it spun the 22 right up into him. Here's John Kernan in Labonte's pit. At first, Bobby said he thought he only had cosmetic damage, and you can see as they changed the four tires on the car, there's a little bit of this grill screen he's out. Bobby also, just before coming on pit road, said that the steering was off about half of the turn. Now you see the crew going to work as they try to bang out that left front fender. That's the Labonte showing some of the effects there. Let's go down to Dale Earnhardt's pit with Jerry Punch is standing by. Well, Earnhardt did get some cosmetic damage in the left front of his Chevrolet Monte Carlo Cruz now working. They have not changed tires. They have got uh, some bungee cords there and trying to pull some of the sheet metal there. Just behind Earnhardt is what's left of the front end of the DuPont Chevrolet. Jeff Gordon pulled the car in. Ray Everett and the company have gone over and raised the hood. There is oil all over the inside of the engine compartment. Apparently, they've either ruptured an oil line or possibly one of the areas back into the oil tank as they are now looking with their... The car is not running. It is sitting on pit road, and Gordon sits very dejectedly inside the car with the window net still up. So working on Earnhardt's car in front of him. He has not lost a lap in the pits. They're trying to get that sheet metal repaired. And Gordon, who wants 
the dominant car here throughout most of the afternoon is in the pits, a victim of an unfortunate accident in turn one. We are under caution once again at Darlington, South Carolina. Back with more after this. Jeff Gordon's car is being pushed behind the wall with extensive damage. Bobby Labonte was also hurt in that uh, crash as far as body damage is concerned. Dale Earnhardt goes back out. Also, Dick Trickle and Morgan Shepard received some damage to their cars in this accident up in turn number one. Replays. First of all, from the blimp. Okay, we see Bobby Labonte in the green car come up and just tap the 22 car, the black car of Gordon, I mean of LaJoy and Gordon. He spins right up into him. And then here's Dick Trickle back there and Morgan Shepard. They jam up. See, Trickle gets knocked into the wall. Shepard gets some damage on the sit go forward. And from another angle, this is from our robotic camera in turn number two, Benny. Once again, just watch the cars and the racetrack gets blocked. And I had not noticed the damage that Dick Trickle and Morgan Shepard had sustained until Ned pointed out just then. And now Morgan Shepard's in car. Okay, just riding along. And all of a sudden, things are going to happen in front of him. We'll just listen. oil that's the oil from Jeff Gord's car that's getting on the windshield because me and I think he broke the oil cooler there are the 22 car spins right in front of Jeff Gordon and Morgan Shepard was actually pushing Dick Trickle up there Trickle couldn't turn because he was uh, being pushed by Morgan Shepard and you see the oil following Jeff Gordon's car I think he's knocked the oil cooler off the car and Ted Musgrave's roof cam spotter did yep. we talked about him that's the spotter saying go low go low and he turned that baby left now here is the lineup as we're almost ready to go back to green although we will not this time around Sterling Marlin is the leader of the race and John Kernan is with Jeff Gordon Jeff we had mentioned earlier today how Darlington never is very kind to you and just when it looked like you were going to finally tame it you were in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah, you know, we lost the lead there uh, to Sterling and Bobby. That Somebody was leaking a bunch of oil, so I got backed out of it. And those guys drove by me. I didn't think anything of it. And, uh, you know, we went back under green there. And I don't know what happened. I just saw uh, LaJoy spin in front of me. And, man, I just I was like, where am I going to go? And I tried to go high and follow Bobby, and uh, just, there wasn't a, a place to go. And if I would have gone low, I might have spun the car. Who, who knows? I mean, we're out of it now. It doesn't really matter. Well, Jeff Gordon, very disappointed. Benny, to answer your question, yeah, they did knock the oil cooler off of it. Now let's go back out to Pit Road where Jerry Punch is caught up with Richard Childress. And, Richard, you may have dodged the bullet up there. Looks like the car isn't hurt that bad. Now it, it, you know, knocked the front end off a little bit there, but I think we're okay now. feel like we got it fixed back pretty good. The car has been getting looser and looser. Any idea if you got, you got the problem solved? Well, we've been keep making adjustments. I think we didn't uh, allow enough for the sun. sun came out and got it pretty hot, and we just a little bit too loose. Down here in the pits, guys, a couple of lucky teams, and some of the teams are saying, hey, there may not be anything left to carry to that wind tunnel next week for the test of the aerodynamics on these race cars. Bob? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a point to make. At least there is hardly a car, if there is one at all, that doesn't have some kind of body damage as a result of all the crashes we've seen here today. And after today's checkered flag at Darlington, it's year number two of NASCAR Shop Talk. And an F-16 heading over to Bill Elliott, our special guest. I think I'll fly this at home this afternoon. You'll be home in a hurry. Bill Elliott joining us on Shop Talk following today's race. Stay with us. ESPN Speed World is being brought to you by Smooth Bush Beer and Easy Drinking Bush Light. Bush, the official beer of NASCAR. By the Robert Bosch Corporation, makers of Bosch Platinum, the ultimate spark plug. And by NASCAR 94 Year in Review. To order, call 871-NASCAR.
They're about to go green as Sterling Marlin is ahead of Steve Grissom, Michael Waltrip, Derek Cope, and Todd Bodine. Your first five. Sixth place is Ted Musgrave. Then Ken Schrader is running in seventh. And the restart comes on lap 209. And Dick Trickle did not get off the very good start. I don't know exactly what the problem was. Meanwhile, we see Sterling Marlin out in front. And Michael Walter almost lost it coming off the corner. Amazingly, there are still 16 cars in the lead lap after all these cars. And only two in the top six that have ever won a NASCAR Winston Cup race. Let's take a look at the start again. They put down oil drive because of all the oil that Jeff Gordon lost, and Michael Walter was forced up into it, and he gets a car out of shape. They didn't see the oil drop coming up behind the cars. He gets the car out of shape. And there goes Todd Bodine and Derek Copine. And Dale Earnhardt is moving up quickly. From 12th place on the restart, he's picked off a couple already. And here he goes by a couple more. Oh, and Jimmy Spencer's wrecked. That's up in, where is it, the back stretch? Yep. And still no caution flag as the car sits there. Well, he's got it rolling again, so now, it, comes out. now it does. Caution comes out. That's 13 cautions today. And you're right, Benny. Something you said during the break, if this was a 500-mile race, we'd have to call it because of darkness. That's right. <laughs> Here we go. The race to the line is on. Pick up all the spots he possibly can, and he's all the way up to about sixth or seventh. All right, let's take a look at the crash on the back stretch. Jimmy Spencer this time. Looks like he was trying to get underneath. Was that the 22 car of LaJoy? Yes, it was. He was trying to get alongside and just lost it coming off the second corner. That was also just a one-car accident, although there were a couple of others that came very close. Now watch this race to the line, or to the restart. That little bump there from Kenny Schrader. He didn't like whatever Earnhardt did. Yeah, that was the race to the line. Yeah, normally. The average speed of this race is only 111 miles an hour, if you can believe that, after a top qualifying speed of 170. <laughs> Back in a minute. Just as you rejoin us, the green flag comes out, and we are racing again. We're on lap 214 of 293. So we're going to run a little over our uh, scheduled off time at 4 o'clock Eastern time. In fact, we may run well over that now. <laughs> <laughs> the way this thing's going, we're going to have to run back Marlin is still the leader. And Steve Grissom in second place. Todd Bodine is third. Derek Cope is fourth. And Michael Walker fifth. There is a car between Marlin and Grissom. That is Jeff Bodine, who is five laps down in 20th position. And now he goes up to the track and allows the faster cars to pass by. Here comes Todd Bodine, who is in third position. A number of these cars that are in the top five, in fact, all of them, excepting Sterling Marlin, are pitting on the backstretch. So that hasn't been a big disadvantage today. The only disadvantage has been running into the wall here yeah. today. I mean, yeah. if you can survive this one, you're going to run up front. Yep, dodging the wrecks has been the yep. key to survival. The auto light field summary showing you where the money is running at the moment, and it will show you that, indeed, there are 16 cars on the lead lap with Morgan Shepard, the last car on the lead lap. A lot of cars have been wrecked. Only a few official out, officially out of the race. But a lot of cars are either still behind the wall or out there running with a lot of body damage. And we got another car in the wall. A big one over in two. And this oh, is a big one. This Look, is a still big coming one. in there. 
Bobby Labonte is in it. Jeff Burton is, and somebody hit the wall really hard on the inside that I did not see. Dick Trickle is involved in it. There's his board. Man. That might have been the one you didn't see, Bob, because there's a lot of damage to it. I think there's somebody down there on the far right of the screen. Maybe not. But there is. There's another car in the smoke. Yeah. Wow. There's the car. Two cars on my Okay, body. it's Rick Mast. And Bobby's body is not uh, feeling too good. No, he isn't. He's gotten out of the car, but he is hurting. What a tough break for all of these guys, really. That have just... And the emergency crew is at the side of the Rick Mass car. He had not lowered the net, so he is also indicating that he is not feeling well also. There's this pit crew running over just to make sure that he's okay. Those on the lead lap are coming into the pits. The 29 car of Steve Grissom did not pin here on the front stretch. He's over on the back stretch. But there you see Earnhardt and Schrader. And Cope is also in, John. Four tire change underway for Derek Cope. They'll put the left side tires on. This car has had problems with getting loose on long runs. They've been making adjustments with air pressure and also with their weight jack. Now let's go down. The four car, I guess, is now is left in, and when Earnhardt is also leaving pit road, Schrader along with John Andretti and Brett Bodine hits down pit road. And they are calling for an ambulance from here on the front stretch to go over to Rick Mast and Bobby Labonte. You see two ambulances there right now and they've called for another one to leave uh, the area here on the front stretch. Here is the replay. Is that the uh, 47 car? Yeah, I believe it is. Billy Standridge. Billy Standridge. He's going to touch car. Rick Mast. Touched him just a little bit. Sent him around right in front of Bobby Labonte. Bobby tried to get slowed down, tried to spin sideways into him. And you watch those cars go down across the track. Labonte gets hit hard by... Was that Jeff Lodive? That was Dick Trickle that hit Labonte really hard. And Rick Mast went down and caught the inside wall hard. Yeah, almost head on. And then the car spun around and hit on the side. So Mass took a really hard shot, as did Bobby Labonte. We'll try once more to look this way. There we see Mass going around up in the inside wall. That's, and there comes Trickle. Boom, right in the side of Labonte's car. Jeff Burton also spins, but I don't think he ran into anyone. The Rebestas car, I don't believe hit anything. Now from Morgan Shepherd's roof camp. opening and he gunned that thing in a hurry didn't he yeah and dick trickle has stopped down in three and four and we see the window net is down and the he's still sitting in there but i think yeah. it's okay are there going to be any cars left here's bill weber Okay, Bob, here on the back stretch, Steve Grissom could not pit because the back pits were closed. Right now, Buddy Parrott is lobbying NASCAR for track position when he finally does pit. But Steve Grissom could not pit because the back pits were closed. They wanted to come in and make a four-tire stop. Right now, Steve Grissom remains on the track, and the discussion continues. We see Bobby Labonte sitting there, and the guys are waving to the ambulance to the rescue people. Come over because Rick Mast walked away. We see Bobby Labonte around the left of your screen as Labonte sitting there talking to a couple people. I, I imagine he said, no, I don't want any medical attention. I'm okay, but just let me sit here for a while. Now he, too, is beginning to walk to the ambulance. It's a rather warm day here today, so uh, I don't know. It, it, it's obvious, though, that neither driver is seriously injured. Both have been able to walk to the ambulance. We'll be back with more from Darlington after these messages. The cleanup continues on the backstretch, taking the car of Rick Mast off. Bobby Labonte's car also involved, Dick Trickle. There is Dick Trickle. His car is uh, down between turns three and four. That's not Dick Trickle. Dick Trickle's still sitting in the car. That's a fireman standing by his car. 
The back pits are still closed, so Steve Grissom, who is at the front of the field right now, along with some others, have not been able to pit. Yeah, including Todd Bodine and Michael Walter. We'll look again here. There again, the 47 car on the inside of Rick Mast. As they come off the corner, they make slight contact. Just enough to send the one car into a spin. Bobby Labonte, the green and black car, the interstate battery car goes in. He spins trying to dodge Mast as they're spinning down the racetrack. Here comes Trickle, and boom, right in the side of the 18 car. There we see Jeff Burton spinning. has pulled up to his car and starting to hook it up. And the, once again, safety workers talking to Dick Trickle, I think they're trying to tell him to get out and go to the hospital. And he says, I'd rather say you're a lot more comfortable in here, probably. Ambulance is arriving at the infield care center here to check the drivers over. And if necessary, they will be transported elsewhere. Bill Weber, the back pits, I guess, are now open. Well, they're waiting for Steve Grissom to come down pit road 55 miles an hour. This team wanted to wait to lap 228 under green conditions, but now they're pitting. They were originally shut out because the back pits were closed when the other leaders pitted on the front stretch. Now the Monte Monte Carlo is here. The Buddy Parrot led crew will make a four tire stop and add fuel. They wanted again to wait six more laps and they felt they could go the distance. Now Buddy has lobbied NASCAR for track position. When I asked him a lap ago if he had any success in that, he just shook his head. He did not answer. So we'll see if we can't get a word with him after this picks up. Steve Grissom is back on his way out of the pits. He beats my just over 19 seconds for the Monte Monte Carlo. Well, I tell you, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Because they, they could not come into the pits, and who knows how they would have come out. All day long, we've seen cars pit on the back stretch and have gained positions on some of those that are pitting on the front stretch. And right now, you know, if it comes out, he's going to be behind all of the cars that are pitting on the front stretch. He went in the, when the caution came out, Steve Grissom was running second. He's now running 12th, or I guess uh, about 10th or 11th. It'll be interesting to see what ruling is made on that. Well, we'll take another break here while the cleanup continues all around the racetrack. We're at Darlington, South Carolina, the Trans South Financial 400. It's just about 4 o'clock Eastern Time. We welcome you back to Darlington, South Carolina, the Trans South Financial 400. We have a lot of laps to go, so obviously we're going to go well over our 4 o'clock schedule off time. Let's do some recapping of some of the incidents that we have had, not all of them. This was how Mark Martin's race ended. Rusty Wallace was also involved in that. Rusty is still out there. And we see that Mark Martin also out there. Here's how the wreck happened on a restart. Mark Martin gets in the back of the 30 car, and Rusty Wallace comes in, and boom, Mark's car in the inside wall. Once again, Steve Kinzer and Ward Burton get together, which eliminates Ricky Rudd, the 18 car spun. He was able to continue without too much damage, but the 31 and 10 were eliminated for the day. Matter of fact, the 18 car continued to run very well and was up in the top. He was second. He was second, yeah, when he was uh, taken out in the most recent incident. Here's Ricky Rudd's in-car shot. Well, I'll give you whiplash. Man, I'm telling you. All right, here, going down in turn one. The 87 car, Nemechek, this was early on in the race. This was the first caution flag, yep. as a matter of fact. And we knew from that point on we were in for a long afternoon, although Joe has been able also to make repairs and get back out there. Here is Greg Sachs hitting the wall. This is one of a couple of incidents that he's been involved in. And that was a one-car accident. And now watch Terry Labonte pass Jeff Bodine and then get the car loose. And Bodine goes up and watch Terry Labonte. He saved it, folks. And 
unbelievable. Totally sideways and saved it. But then the next lap, something did break on Labonte's car, and he crashed in almost the same spot coming off turn four. Darrell Waltrip was involved in an incident. of the accidents today at Darlington. The green flag is out once again. Back to racing, and Ted Musgrave is the leader of the race for the first time in 1995. Ted is at the front. Derek Cope is second. There are three Fords up front. Morgan Shepard is a third-place car as he tries to go by Jeff Bodine, is now doing it on the outside. I forgot there, was there were some concessions made on those pitting on the backstretch. Because Ted uh, or Steve Grissom is up there in fourth position. Sure is. I don't know how the calculations were made, but they did have some adjustments, which uh, I think they should have. Grissom fourth, Michael Walter fifth, and Todd Bodine is in sixth. Here is Jerry Punch. Well, just a moment ago, before the green came back out, we had about half a dozen cars come back in on lap 225 and top off the tank. Sterling Marlin, Dale Earnhardt, Kenny Strader, and Brett Bodine. Those, all, those cars are all in the lead lap, and they all four felt if they topped it off, they could go the distance without another pit stop here if we didn't get another caution, that is. Another pit stop for fuel. They go all the way. Bob? Okay, that explains then some of how they they were relined up then while we were watching all those replays when they came down and made those pit stops. And uh, thanks, Jerry, for bringing us up to date on that. Lincoln's out the lead. We're watching from the roof cam of Ken Schrader, who is ninth. There's still 12 cars now on the lead left. From the 25 car of Ken Schrader. Look at the three, Dale Earnhardt, and the four car of Sterling Marlin. There's a race for third place between Morgan Shepard, the 21 single car, Steve Grissom, 29, the black and yellow, Monique Chevrolet. That's for third place. Steve Grissom's best career finish in Winston Cup was his sixth at Rockingham earlier this year, so he's having his best run. And now looks to the inside of Morgan here on the straightaway. Can't quite make it. We heard that radio. That was a spotter getting ready. Now Sterling Marlin and Dale Earnhardt are both charging up on Todd Bodine. Sterling had a notion to try on the inside going into turn three, but decided different. Or Earnhardt is putting the pressure on Sterling Marlin. Sure is. off that fourth corner. John Curtin is with Rick Mast. Well, Rick Mast has come out of the infield care center. Rick, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, my next little store, but uh, you know, they've had a lot of wrecks today, but the problem is the biggest part of a lot of them is that there's a couple lap cars or a couple cars down a lap, and we only got one groove here, and they're getting in there and running all over the place, wrecking everybody. Uh, the 47 car's been all over the racetrack. You know, I was trying to get by him down there, he run me up high, he run me low. I finally got by him. He run up in the left rear and turned me, and I started that whole wreck down there. It's just ridiculous, but it's, you got to deal with that every week. Or not every week, but a lot of weeks you got to deal with stuff like that. But it's part of it. Well, Rick Mast is okay. Glad to report also Bobby Labonte is still being checked out. They brought him in. He was favoring his left side, Bob. And positions being changed up front as Todd Bodine passes Morgan Shepard. Here are Earnhardt and Sterling Marlin. Right behind Morgan. And wow, Rick Mast. Tell them what happened over turn two. You saw Dale Earnhardt hit by Sterling Marlin. A two and a half second separation between first and fifth. Now here's Earnhardt passing Morgan Shepard at the end of the back stretch. The tape flapping on the Sitco Ford. Showing wounds of earlier accidents today. Musgrave is sitting out there. He's a good, comfortable lead. Right now, he is uh, three and three quarters of a second ahead of David Earnhardt. And we see Sterling Marlin getting by Morgan Shepard. We heard Morgan Spotter tell him on the inside. We talk 
talked earlier about Ken Schrader and how he has had the worst year of the three Hendrick drivers, but he's the only survivor of this one. And he's trying to get by Morgan Shepard. Makes a run, going off the second corner. And he does take his spot away. Puts Schrader up into eight. For those of you just joining us uh, and you saw our recap, we did not show you how Jeff Gordon was taken out of the race. He was also involved in an accident that's put his car behind the wall. As we watch this, they're trying to push Jeff, well, they are pushing Jeff Burke's car down the pit road, trying to restart this car. Something's happened to it. He was not, he was, he spun coming off the second corner, but didn't look like he hit anything, but the car will not restart. And he drove right to the garage area after that incident, but now it's back on pit road, but they're pushing it back again as we continue to watch the action on the racetrack. The 75 and the three are battling for four position. Todd Bodine and Dale Earnhardt for fifth. never won NASCAR Winston Cup races. Only Derry Cope, who is running second, has. of AutoZone showing you the on-track interval between laps 234 and 238. As a matter of fact, Derek Cope and Ted Grissom are closing in on Ted Musgrave, too. Ted got caught behind some trap, lap traffic there a moment ago and really cost him a good bit of time. Sterling Marlin's car, the Kodak Film Chevrolet, who was so strong earlier, we saw Earnhardt pass him a moment ago and drive away from Sterling Marlin. He's, so it looks like Sterling's car is just not handling properly right now. There is Sterling. He has brought back several cars behind Earnhardt. John Kernan has an update on Bobby Labonte. Well, I just talked to his PR man, Larry Camp, and Larry just came out of the infill care center from uh, talking with Bobby and they're observing Bobby right now he's complaining of pain in his left shoulder it's bruised up is what Larry says well, of course Bobby's suffering from the flu dehydrated so they're giving him some fluids trying to rehydrate him right now Bobby Labonte is being observed in there we don't know if he's going to be transported Larry Camp doesn't seem to think so he thinks it's just a bruised left shoulder now let's go to Bill Weber well back here in the Meineke Monte Carlo pits they're watching Steve Grissom catch the leader at about a half second a lap. Big crash though. Up in turn one and Brett Bodine and somebody else. That's uh, John Andretti, the Kmart car, is sitting up against the wall. There we see Brett Bodine is spun down. Nope, the it's Davey Jones. I'm sorry. I'm sorry and all the Andretti people will be glad to know that was not <laughs> him. The Davy Jones people will be sad to know that it is him. Yes to drive away the 77 car of Davy Jones, which was only a lap down in 13th position. So Davy had had a pretty good run going after a disappointing qualifying effort that uh, resulted in his starting back in 34th position. But a lot of damage to that Jesper USA Ford. US Air. US Air Ford, yeah. Well, USA, yeah. yeah. So what's that? 15 cautions. And now, Benny, you begin to wonder if we're going to get 400 miles in before it gets done. And here's the car going on Penn Road. All the leaders. Ted Musgrave coming in. Derek Cope. There's Earnhardt. Sterling Marlin. 
also Schrader, Shepard, and John Andretti as we watch Musgrave. Here's John Kearney. Ted Musgrave been all the way down, pit stall number 23. Uh, don't get much farther back than that. Right side tires already on, left side tires on, but the good news is he still is on the front straightaway. A good pit stop for Ted Musgrave. Let's go down to Earnhardt's pit. They have changed right side tires. They're going to put a round of bike back in the rear of the car. Cope is out there. We're going to take some tape off the front of the car, but Earnhardt, 18.4 seconds, and we're going to. Let's go to the back pits and Bill Weber. Steve Prism is in. This is a daring change. This team could go the distance, and Steve Prism had just radioed in that the four tires they put on just a few laps ago were the four best tires he's had all day. Now he's got four new ones, definitely enough fuel to reach the finish. He was sixth yesterday. He's desperately trying to get out. The leaders have gone by. Prism's on his way. Beats out Michael Waltrip. But he's going back to about eighth or ninth position. All the cars on the front straightaway, on the front straightaway pits, all right, here's a replay of the wreck. Jones hit the wall early, and then uh, Brett Bodine got involved. Yeah, I did not see it, so I, yeah, it's hard to say what happened. Yeah. In any case, Brett, as we said, was able to drive away. However, Davy Jones is not able to, and the wrecker is there in front of the car. We're going to take another break. We have completed 245 of 293 laps in the Trans South Financial 400. Well, since starting its national tour in September of 92, the Family Channel Blip has delighted thousands of tech spectators with appearances at fairs, festivals, and sporting events like this one in 90 cities and 35 states across the country. And they are hovering overhead today, providing some overhead shots. Now that pond that Dave Despain referred to earlier today that at the it. top right of your screen? That ain't it. Okay. That's not it. Excuse me. I'm good English that. That's not it. Okay. But it's water. It's a pond and you there's probably fish in it. You didn't know what I was going to say. I, sa I was just going to say that pond there that you see has a lot of fish in it that Kyle Petty may be <laughs> trying to catch right now. <laughs> At, while we speak, as yes. we speak. <laughs> Guess who's leading? Dale Earnhardt. For the first time today, as a matter of fact. That is man. correct. Yep. As Jared pointed out. All right, let's check the summary and see how that happened. Musgrave was first, but comes out third. Cope from second to fifth. Grissom third to seventh. He's on the backstretch. Mike Walter fourth to eight. He's on the backstretch. And Earnhardt gained five positions from sixth to first. Jerry? Well, Dale Earnhardt came in, and we saw his pit stop. Now, what they had talked about was putting a round of bite in the car, but I guess in the hurry to try to be able to beat the four car out of the pits, that's not what happened. I was calling the pit stop. and said they're going to put a round of bite in the car to tighten it up, and that's not what happened. They actually took a round of bite out of the car. So now Earnhardt is two rounds of bite away from where he would like his car to be, which means he's probably going to be quite a bit looser than he wants to be when we go back to green flag racing. Big, big smile down here for Jack Roush as he's down in Ted Musgrave's pit. They were about 20 laps short of going the distance on fuel. So as soon as that caution came out, Jack Roush did a little dance, a little jiggle up on uh, the pit wall as they are now able to go the distance. Although they did lose two spots in the pits, Musgrave will be restarting this race in third. All right, watching from Ted Musgrave's in-car camera. And let's watch Dale Earnhardt's pit stop, Benny, and maybe we can see what they did. Well, they see they're putting the wrench in the right side, and they're tightening down. They're, they're on top of the spring. Right below that is where they adjust the panhard bar. They tighten that bolt down, or yes, turn the bolt down, and that does take wedge out of the car, just like Jerry Punch told us, and loosens the car up. And they wanted to go the other way. They wanted to loosen that boat. Well, we'll see how he does here when we go back to racing. Still no indication that we will do so. So we will take another break. And be back in just a moment with 248 laps completed. Dale Earnhardt is your leader now over Sterling Marlin and Ted Musgrave. There's a Napa <laughs> Field summary for you. Boy. <laughs> Jeff Bodine is trying He's to pass the, the pace car. <laughs> trying to pass the time as he <laughs> drafts Elmo Langner, the pace car driver. All right, the field summary now.
Wow, you're either in the lead lap or you're way behind. Uh, way, it, way behind. Uh, yeah. The first car, as we saw there, was uh, Billy Stanbridge in 14th position. He yep. is four laps down in 13th position. Yep, there, there are uh, 12 cars on the lead lap, and the next one is four laps down. I'm going to try to talk to Michael Walter uh, and see. Michael Walter, this is Benny Parsons up in the ESPN. You read us? Yeah, Benny. Man, this has been some day, hasn't it? Have you ever seen the like of stuff I've gone through? <laughs> no, and you're still running in the lead lap. Well, we uh, we we think we're going to be good here. I think I can pass some of these guys, but uh, as y'all can real well tell, track position is everything, and the three and the four are going to be long gone by the time I get through the traffic. So we got a work cut out for us, but this Penzoil Pontiac has been it's been good all year, Benny. It's just had some problems and. Uh, just hanging in there, trying to dodge all these wrecks. You know how that goes. At almost 170 miles an hour, this racetrack is getting more narrow than ever, isn't it? It, it. They should have done something when they paved it. If, if you could just, if they would have just taken and widened the turns. You know, I know it wouldn't be the same old Darlington, but these ain't the same old race cars like I said you and Ned was racing back in the 20s and 30s. <laughs> so, Wait a minute. <laughs> maybe we don't need to run on the same old Darlington. I know some of them don't anyway. <laughs> Michael, I want you to know I raced in the 80s, not the 20s and 30s. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I remember seeing you around. <laughs> and Ned raced in the 60s, too. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like I raced in the 30s today. Now, I just want to tip my cap to my spotter. He's doing a great job today. And Doug Hewitt and Ron Perrier and all the boys that worked so hard on this car for me. feel like we're going to be all right this year, run good all year long. Hopefully, we'll be right. All right, Michael, good luck. Let's try Ted Musgrave and see what he what's going on with him. By the way, the spotter for Mike Walker is Terry Smith. He didn't name me my name. Ted Musgrave, this is Benny Parsons up at ESPN. You read me? Yeah, Benny, I got you. How's everything going? Pretty wild, huh? I'll tell you, that's about the wildest darling I've seen ever. I mean, this is the way it used to be. It's not supposed to be like this in the 90s. Well, Benny, I'll tell you what. You know, when we started going here with this car and that control the guys, it looks like it's going to be a good points race for us. We just stay out of trouble. That's all we've been doing. You're up in third spot. You got anything with those two Chevrolets in front of you? Well, I'll tell you the truth, Benny. I think I might have something for one of them. I don't know about the second one. Which one you got something for? Well, I think the four car may have a broken valve spring, so I might be able to get, you know, get a lot of pressure on him getting by. I don't know, Benny. Like I say, they're awful tough, but this car's running pretty good, too, in the long run. Well, good luck, Ted. Thanks, Benny. I'll see you later. That was great. So you, uh, you hinted, Benny, that something might be wrong with uh, Sterling Marlin, and he confirms it might be a broken valve spring. All right, I see Mark Martin. He's had a pretty rough day. Let's see if he's uh, up to... Uh, we don't have the six car in our racing radios, racing electronics, I'm sorry. Hook up. <laughs> there it is, all beat up and wounded, but still, still out there. We'll try to dial in Daryl here. Oh, does racing electronics have Daryl? Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Daryl Walter, this is Benny Parsons of ESPN. You read me? Yeah, Ben, how come you wait till the race about a whip car throw all the pieces, and then you call me? Well, I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, we, we've been trying to document who's going to win, who's going to lose, but right now, I don't know who's going to win, who's going to lose. What would this thing be like for 500 miles today? It'd be called because of darkness, we think. I know I'm pretty dim in here. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you're pretty beat up in that Western Auto Chevy. Well, we were messed up in the get-go there, and I don't know why the air pressure or the tires we started on or something. I'm not sure what it was, but got going real good, and then I run over something going down the back. I felt it, but I couldn't get out of the throttle and get woed up quick enough to keep getting it up in the fence. Two laps down would really look good right now. Yeah, it really would look good. As a matter of fact, you'd be in about 12 spot and might have a chance to win this thing. <laughs> hey, I ain't give up yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time, Daryl. I think it's time to give up. <laughs> All right. Well, I just wish I could run good enough to watch the race anyway. I hate to catch them every now and then. Well, if you just slow down a little bit, they'll be about a lap in about 10 laps. You can race with them then. I just, I'm just uh, marking, uh, putting down miles today, Ben. It's one of those days. The only thing I got to look forward to is Bristol. You like that place, don't you? 
can't wait. I know I'm going to run good at Bristol. I know I'm going to have a shot at winning one. I just uh, get out of here today and go on up there. Hey, Daryl, you're a TV guy, right? Oh, well, I try to be a little bit of everything, you know. Well, how about taking us to break? How about just telling everybody, you know, that we're going to commercial? How about doing that for us? All right, folks, I know y'all probably get a little bit tired sitting there eating all that popcorn, drinking all them Cokes and Pepsis, but uh, don't go away. There's got to be some more excitement. There's too many cars still rolling. Don't go away now. Don't touch that dial. Don't turn over to nothing, and uh, we'll be right back. Back at Darlington, they were going green this lap, but they waved it off. And so now they will get the one more to go signal before we get back to racing. It's going to be Earnhardt at the front of the field with Marlin, Musgrave, Schrader, and Cope. This is unbelievable. Poor old Jeff Burton. He spun out, what, at least twice today. Really didn't hit anything, but somehow the car wouldn't start. And they've been pushing it back and forth, pushing it back and forth, and finally it started, and guess what? It caught on fire. Well, well, you know, just look at all the, yeah. where the fire extinguishers have put the fire out. There's Jeff Burton talking to Donnie Richardson. Donnie Richardson said, <laughs> I can't believe this happened also. He beat Sean in 19th place, though. Yep. Well, let's take a look at the manufacturer's battle. In the top 10, there are four Chevys, four Fords, and two Pontiacs, 11 through 20, nine Fords and one Pontiac, 21 through 35 Chevys, three Fords and two Pontiacs, and then 31 through 40, there are four Chevys and six Fords, and 41 through 42, one and one Chevy and Ford. Well, pace Elmo car. finally quit. Yeah, pace car finally parked it, so now we'll get ready to go back to racing. It'll be 2.56 when we go back at the beginning of lap 2.56. Looks like 255 according to the scoreboard, but yeah, it will be completing lap 255 and on lap 256. Oh. Just let this race is 293. So yeah. We still got a while to go. And it's still anybody's race. And we'll see if Ted Musgrave does have something or at least Sterling Marlin as he thought he might. Who's that trainer on top there? On the high side, and here comes Morgan Trevor trying to get by. Coke got by him. Right up on the outside of Shepard, and he figured Shepard didn't know he was there, which was smart to back out. Now Shepard comes down on the inside of Schrader and makes the pass. Up front, it is Musgrave who is breathing down the rear spoiler of Sterling Marlin. And Dale Earnhardt, let's don't forget that Dale Earnhardt went the wrong way with the chassis adjustment, so you know, what's his car going to be like? Yep. And meanwhile, poor Ken Schrader, something wrong with his car, he's losing even more spots. I believe the car is just not him. He's dropping way, way back. Flat right front is what we hear. Oh, man, look okay. at behind the turns. He's trying to get to the inside, it looks like. He's trying to get to the inside. Jeff went on trying to pass him down there. <laughs> that can't get out of the way. Well, that stayed down pretty good that time. He might have slowed down at that point to stay down there. There he goes to the, I guess he's going to the pits. He's yeah. very, very slow. Yep, he's coming in pit road. Tough break for Kenny Schrader. Now I'm going to drop him at least a lap down. Budweiser Chevy rolls in while on the racetrack. Shepard, Grissom. Our battling for fifth. Yeah, I'm Michael Walter. Michael's back behind Griffin. up on the back, shoots to the inside, and passes Morgan Shepard going into one. Now for Michael Walters. Yeah. on the scoreboard. The scoreboard here at the track has missed the first five positions. And Ken Schrader completing the tire change. He's back on the racetrack, building up speed down the back straightaway as we watch this competition between Sitco and Pennzoil. Michael trying to get to the inside, can't make it. Jeff Gordon has led the most laps here today, 156, and among the lap leaders, one of the highest totals.
goes to Elmo Langley. He's been out there 87 laps at the front of the field. Because he drives the pace car. Morgan Shepard to the 21 car has been in. How many wrecks today, Ned? Just one or is it two? I think he's been in a couple of bump ups and yeah. Uh, yeah. still hanging in there. Yeah. Jeff Gordon wrecked. Brand field summary. Near the top 10. And 11 on the lead lap. Here's John Andretti, who has stayed in the top 10 just about all afternoon in the Kmart Little Caesars Ford. And he's ch chasing those guys. Yep. Grissom. Morgan Shepard. Michael Walker. A lot of spots up there. John Andretti can get there, or Bobby Hamilton either. Yeah, Bobby Hamilton right on Andretti's back bumper. Now here's up front, first and second, Earnhardt and Marlin. The full way back to separate Carlin from Musgrave. I tell you what, if Sterling Marlin does in fact have a broken bow spring, then Earnhardt's car is losing. Here comes Marlin on the inside. He's got to run. Nope, can't quite make it. We see the Musgrave was able to Musgrave was able to close in a couple of times as they raced each other. 29 to go. Of course, the points leader coming into this race with a 72-point advantage over Marlin. The Musgrave was able to close up when Marlin almost got up beside of Earnhardt. Blair is a problem. Looks to me like Benny. Yes, it is. You can see right here. You go from bright sunlight and a glare into shadows, and your eyes have to do some major adjusting. That's why we've seen that when we see the cars in the pits, making the pit stop, some guy over there cleaning the windshield, and he stays there the entire time that the cars in the pits, just cleaning and cleaning the windshield because of the visibility. Todd Bodine on the inside of Morgan Shepard. We see Michael Waltrip has already gotten by Morgan, and here comes Todd trying to pass the 30 car of Michael Waltrip. It's a battle for sixth. Waltrip in sixth and back. Meanwhile, the lead up front. Uh oh, was going to make a move. What was that that I saw from Musgraves? So, Puff of Smoke got a one of those cars. Was it Musgraves? Looked like it. No, couldn't tell. Doesn't look like it's hurt to run if it was Musgraves' car. Let's see. Let's watch as we come off the corner. And one of those cars. Nope, it was it was uh, Sterling's car, was yeah. Marlin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure it was. So I guess he does have a, in fact, a broken bow spring. And so Musgrave was talking about. He's running pretty doggone good. To be on seven cylinders, and our car, no doubt, is loose. Musgrave's got to be thinking, hey, I'm not taking a chance with these guys. Yeah, it's a little bit crippled. Only 25 to go. Uh oh, Musgrave got too high down in one. Ted's 127th Winston Cup race. His best finish was at Daytona this year, a fourth. He was a rookie back in 1991 and finished in the runner-up to Bobby Hamilton, who won Rookie of the Year honors that year. Here's the battle that continues between Andretti and Hamilton. This is for ninth place. Andretti has the nice position. Hamilton wants it. As we watch this battle, the car number eight of Jeff Burton, they finally got that thing fired. He's going back out of the track. He won't be able to see the white dust for about two laps. <laughs> He's 50 laps down right now in 20th position. Boy, Hamilton really closes in in the corner, but Andretti gets away from him in the straightaway. Darling. 
down to the many, many laps. Michael Walter, Todd Bodine, got a good race going. There's Smith right in front of him. On the leaderboard, only a tenth of a second separates first and second, and almost five seconds back to fifth. But the first three, as you can see, separated by less than a half second, and Todd Bodine takes the position away from Michael, but uh, he's yeah. trying. <laughs> No, I won't take a chance on crashing here because after what I've seen today, it would be easy to do. <laughs> now Bobby Hamilton has passed John Andretti, and here comes Jeff Bodine to do the same. So Jeff Bodine is yeah. five laps down in 14th position, but nevertheless, he did make the pass. So now Bobby Hamilton moves up tonight. He's now four laps down in 34th place. John Andretti has a top 10 finish this year. Bobby Hamilton also has one top 10 finish. Up front, it is still Dale Earnhardt looking for his first win in 1995, pursued by Daytona 500 winner Sterling Marlin. There's Billy Standridge again in the 47 car, and the leaders put another lap on him. And now a battle between Grissom and Todd Bodine. Bodine's running well. He's going to pass Steve going into the first turn. Yes, sir. Todd Bodine right now might be as fast as anyone on the racetrack. He moves up to fifth. It's fifth, sixth, and seventh right there. Back up front, it is still Earnhardt. In fact, he has pulled away now a little bit in the last lap or two from Sterling Marlin and Ted Musgrave. Derek Cope is fourth, Bodine fifth, 274 of 293 laps complete. Our stock car race is continuing here. The Formula One race was supposed to start at 4.30, so hang in there. It's coming up next. There are your top six qualifiers. Damon Hill, the top. Michael Schumacher has crashed at least twice in the practice and qualifying. And then you got some Ferraris back there in fifth and sixth. So stay tuned for the Grand Prix of Brazil, the opener of the Formula One season this year. Coming up next, Shop Talk. Well, stay tuned, and we will have information regarding when that will be on a little bit later. This race has gone slightly beyond what we thought it would. <laughs> no, it's gone well beyond what we thought it would. And we see the front two cars of Earnhardt and Sterling Marlin is then to pull away from the 16 car of Ted Musgrave, but this traffic just might help Musgrave out and catch these two cars. Here's Jerry Punch with more on Sterling Marlin. We heard Ted Musgrave report earlier. He saw, he thought that Marlin may have a valve spring broken, and we saw possibly a puff of smoke earlier out of the four car. Now I've spoken with Tony Glover, Larry McClure, Ed McClure, everybody but Grandma McClure, and they have no idea that they have any engine problem. In fact, if we don't know anything about it. Sterling doesn't know anything about it. In fact, we're at the lead right now. So they feel like their car is running awfully well here in the final 25 laps. Bob? Okay, it looks like it could come down to either of these two. And you'll remember how these cars race to the checkered flag at Daytona with Sterling up front. It's a new record for the most last under caution in any uh, spring look race. Here, look here, down the front straightaway. Sterling trying to get to the inside. Can't make it. Not scared. Yeah. And, and, and we'll, we'll watch him as they go up the back stretch, come off the turn two here. He is not losing anything on the straightaway at all. So I, and here he's gaining on the straightaway, yeah. as a matter of fact. He's going to turn three. He'll get it this time. Yep. But watch Earnhardt try to slip right back under. <laughs> no, it didn't no, do it, it that time. Sterling's no. kept her down, was able to keep it down, but that allows Ted Musgrave to get right up to him. So Sterling Marlin takes the lead of the Grand South Financial 400 with 11 laps to go. Now Ted Musgrave is in third, right behind Earnhardt. Earl Marlin's going to check out on here now, guys. Yeah. Earnhardt's car has just has went away, has gone away. It's just, I think that, that loose situation that Jerry Punch talked about, the rare mistake by the Childress team, took the round to wedge out instead of put a round in it to make a world. 
Feel that Dale Earnhardt will still be satisfied with what he gets out of this race because although he wants to win as many races as possible this year, we know that in the back of his mind is the eighth championship. And he is on the way to at this point. There is Mike. Uh, Ted, uh, that's Mike Wallace there. The 90 car. And there's a race for what's that fourth place? Yes, it is. Todd Bodine still on the move in the factory stores Ford, trying to move around Derek Cope. Since his last pit stop, he has been on the move. He really has. Apparently they made some adjustments on his Ford. So he is on the move. Derek back to field. Way back behind them in sixth place is the car number 30 of Michael Hall. There's Steve Russell, who is running in. Well, he's running six, and, and Michael Walker is seven. The 47 car of Billy Standridge will register or is on his way to registering his best career finish ever. He was 24th here in September. It was late speed by him in the span car. His previous best finish, 24th in Standridge, currently is in 14th position. Continuing to watch second and third here, Earnhardt and Musgrave. There's Kenny Trainer being lapped as you see Sterling Marlin passing him. Trainer just went two left down. He's in left position. Had that flat tire. Lost a lap there. Dad, I got a question for you. Huh? You know, NASCAR was going to impound a Ford Chevrolet Pontiac today to take to the wind tunnel and see uh, which car was the best. Where are they going to find one of these today? <laughs> That's right. That, that would be wind tunnel material. Yes. Really. I mean, you know, because when you go to the wind tunnel, you, you want smooth cars yeah. and the sides and all of that. It's not going to happen. This is Ted Musgrave yes, trying to sir. take over second position. He got a run on him. I don't know whether he can do it or not. They touch coming off two, and Musgrave will not make the move. We would like to thank Racing Electronics for providing the in-car radios that we have enjoyed here on ESPN and on the Deuce this afternoon. We can dial up just about any frequency we want to and talk to whomever we want to, and we have enjoyed the conversation we've had with the drivers today. And on the Deuce, they've been able to hear the conversation between the drivers and their crews. We're down now to a handful of laps to go in this one. Coming up on traffic is Earnhardt and Ted Musgrave coming off of turn four. They get around one car. Now they come up on Rusty Wallace. Rusty will give him a play run, though. He's, he's just out there making laps, and he's made a lot of laps since he came back out, made up a lot of positions. Here's a great race for fifth spot. The 12 car, Gary Cope is fifth. There's sixth, Steve Grissom, and seventh, Michael Walker. there for yep. second place with three laps to go. Leslie Marlin looks like he has things under control, but the battle is for second place, and Musgrave once again has a run coming off the second corner. Just cannot... Well, now they're running up on the left car, he had to back off. Yep. He could not get in there at that time because there were three cars going slow into the turn, and that might have been, been enough to let Earnhardt... To, it, it did keep the position right then, but maybe for the duration of the race. Just two more laps to go. This is where, this is where Musgrave has been beating Earnhardt off the second corner. He's, He's trying it again. He's got it. Now, is Earnhardt going to back off when he gets No, that sir. Turn? No, sir. <laughs> yeah, he did. Now he's trying to drive under, <laughs> under Musgrave. See? Oh, oh, there he goes. Back out on the inside. That's a patented move. Yeah. Nobody does it better that move than Dale Earnhardt. Now, Ted will have to do it again coming off the two over there. But the next time, you say, well, I'll slow that thing down. It's a little bit going into three. Keep her down on the bottom of the race track. Let's see if he can do it. This is the white flag. We're on the final lap. Sterling Marlin is a half a lap away from winning the Trans-South Financial 400. We continue to watch this battle for second place. No, I didn't get up beside him that time coming off the two. Nope. 
Marlin is in turn three and four. We'll keep an eye on him. Here are Earnhardt and Musgrave going through the corner. Here is Marlin taking the checkered flag, winning the race. Let's watch the battle for a second. It goes to Earnhardt by about a half a car length. Ted Musgrave third. Here's a battle. Steve Brissom finishes in sixth and Michael Waltrip seventh. And Bill Weber was with Tony Glover. A celebration is on, and you drove those last 20 laps. I watched you. Congratulations. Well, I always wanted to be a race car driver and never got the opportunity, but uh, I like to ride with Sterling. How about that? You guys won at Daytona. You come back here a wild day. Tony, you ever seen anything like this? I tell you, it's one of the wildest races I've ever been to in my life. And, uh, you know, I hate Jeff Gordon had his bad luck ever because, uh, you know, it was going to be a good race between us and him. Uh, we never had really showed our hand yet, but he had an awful good race car. Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Well, you know, the Chevrolet Monte Carlo is a good race car, but if you look at that 16 coming in there, Ted Musgrave, he had a heck of a good race car today, too. Sterling Marlin, Tony Glover, and the Kodak Films team celebrates today in the Trans-South 400. Sterling Marlin was not able to back up his win at Daytona last year. He has this year, and he receives congratulations from members of various crews as he comes down and heads for victory lane. Sterling Marlin from Columbia, Tennessee, wins in the Kodak film Chevrolet. But Tony is right. Must, uh, Musgrave in the Ford hung in there, and Todd Bodine in another Ford had a great day. There's the three car of Dale Earnhardt, which finished in second position. Down at the gas pumps, getting the thing filled up. We see the NASCAR officials standing there by the car, making sure that no one tampers with it. They'll fill the car up with fuel and take it back and inspect it to make sure that it meets weight and all the other rules that they have to go by. But that's basically a formality because, uh, trust me, they will. Andrew Petrie looking at the car and saying, hmm, I wonder where we missed it today. Sterling isn't going to be, eat, be able to eat into Earnhardt's points lead by very much. They both led, of course, and uh, because of the point system, Sterling will pick up very few points. Uh, five, as a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah. Since uh, neither of them led the most laps, that distinction went to Jeff Gordon, who, of course, was eliminated in a crash, as were several others. Well, there's a happy guy. Taking that helmet off. Ooh. Have a sip there, Stuart. You earned it. <laughs> Let me get out of this thing and see. There we go. Tim Morgan there the, with the mustache. Jerry Punch is right there. And the celebrating continues. A big hug for crew chief Tony Glover and a big swig of Gatorade. Uh, Sterling, congratulations on a tremendous day. A survival afternoon for you. Man, I ain't never seen it like it. Uh, you know, Tony, he's the best. He taught me all the way through it and be patient. And uh, had a real good car, the Kodak Delco Badger car. And just uh, sit there and road when we needed to and, and run hard when we had to. And uh, the car just followed us all day. They gave me great pit stops and uh, everything worked out great. How close were you at times to some of the uh, onslaughts and the melees that took place out there? I missed every one of them. I guess it's all behind us. And uh, one time we got some stayed around. I hit the wall off, uh, off two, but uh, we got a little loose one time, adjusted wrong, and uh, fell back. But uh, they adjusted the car right back and come right back to front. Now, some of the drivers said you might have had a problem with the uh, valve spring or something late in the race. You weren't taking off on the restarts. Was that by design? <laughs> it looks like we had the wrong uh, ratio in the transmission. The uh, we was about 4,000 RPM. We need to be about 4,500, and we just couldn't take off. Last year, you didn't capitalize, didn't take the momentum from Daytona. This year, you have. What's been the difference? Well, you know, we've run the same as we had. I tell you, the crews really worked hard all winter, built these new Monte Carlos, and, and practice pit stops. They've been practicing pit stops all week. We got beat Atlanta a little bit, and they give me great pit stops, and, uh, you know, the team's pumped up and fired up, and I am too, so we're going to try to win this championship. Any questions at all in your mind that you could get Earnhardt with the final 25 laps when you went back to green? Well, our car seemed to be the best on a long run, and I could run Gordon down a little bit, but we just couldn't go on new tires. And, uh, you know, it just worked out that uh, we didn't, you know, get, get a caution toward the end and uh, him get in get a chance to get tires. Sterling, congratulations. Thank you, Jerry. 
Sterling Marlin's third career win comes at the track too tough to tame, the 39th annual Trans South 500, and Sterling brings that car to victory lane for the second time here in 1995. Bob? And he becomes the 33rd different driver to take the checkered flag in victory here at the track too tough to tame. And we will be back with more from Darlington, South Carolina. And the Trans South Financial 400 won this afternoon by Sterling Marlin. The Sterling Marlin fans are celebrating here at uh, Darlington after their driver won today. Quest for the Cup standings. Dale Earnhardt remains on top. Sterling Marlin remains second, and Mark Martin remains in third position. Derek Cope jumped five positions today as fourth in the points. Terry Labonte lost one position down to fifth. Ted Musgrave jumped six positions to sixth. Morgan Shepard jumped three positions. Jeff Gordon lost two. Dale Jarrett lost four. And John Andretti jumped five positions. Here's Bill Weber. Well, we're here with Dale Earnhardt. Dale, you couldn't hold Sterling off there at the end. The uh, car was real loose. Got, or it wasn't loose on new tires, but then it'd get looser and looser. I couldn't hold. I didn't have nothing for him. And, uh, but our car, one run was real good. We just kept adjusting with it, never got the car perfect. So. We didn't win. It's lucky to get second, really. It's lucky to have your car in one piece the way things were out there today. Well, that's true. We got some bummed up uh, left front here, but uh, really fortunate not to have a tore-up race car. And I don't know. The groove just wasn't wide. They didn't have a wide groove. And uh, once they got dirt on the track, the track was real treacherous up there high. And we just need a, lot, a little wider racing service, I think, for all these cars as fast as they're going. Dale, a lot of the co-favorites for the championship failed to finish today. You did another big step toward an eighth title. Well, it is, but Sterling second, and he, finished, he won the race. So, you know, we notch him here, notch him there. That's what we're after, just consistent finishes. We've had top fives every race, so working hard at that. That's the guys did a good job spinning all the boys back to shop. And Andy, to fix this car from, uh, you know, we tore it up down here testing. And then uh, it's pretty neat to come back with the same car and run second. So we're happy with it. She was in bad shape. She's, uh, she'll make it to Bristol now. And that's where we're going next. Right now to John Kernan with Ted Musgrave. Well, a career best for uh, Ted Musgrave with a third-place finish. Uh, you thought you had a little something for the four car. Turned out that he didn't have that valve spring problem after all and wound up winning. Yeah, I turned around. I didn't think I had anything for the three car, but at the end I did. And just needed a few more laps. You know, he gave me that classic Earnhardt pass on the three and four, and I knew that was coming. I tried to keep it down uh, low, but I'll tell you, you know, that Roush Family Channel speed stick car, it ran good all day, you know, kept us out of trouble and, uh, you know, want to lead some laps early on. And, you know, everything fell into place. You know, we worked hard at this, and the guys made all the right decisions in the uh, in the pits. So my hat's off to the whole crew. They did an excellent job for me today. They worked overtime Friday, considering what happened in practice for Friday. You guys got the car put back together and ran great. Well, you had to bring that up. You know, we just had a, we just got a Darlington stripe on the left side. All it did is just scrape up the sheet mat a little bit in practice, you know, and uh, come qualifying, I told the guys, I said, you walked off, hard to get this thing back together and looking nice. I'll take it easy and got on the front stretch. And from there on, it was just a cruise for us. You know, like I say, what it would have been a lot different. There was a lot of accidents out there. A lot of top teams got knocked out, but our car was still strong no matter what. All right, congratulations, Ted. Let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch. We caught up with Todd Bodan, and Todd from 31st to 4th, uh, pitting on the back stretch. Uh, about half a dozen of those wrecks were right in front of you. Yeah, it was uh, survival of the fittest today. Uh, the racetrack was tough. With one groove, it was hard to pass, but uh, fortunately, our car was real good on long runs. The longer we'd run, the better we'd get, and the, everybody'd back up to us, and that was our strong suit. Uh, you know, I passed a couple there at the end to get some spots, but uh, the factory stores forward just they ran great. We we struggled in practice. We made some changes this morning, and, and they really worked. And you know, fortunately, I like Darlington, and we ran good. And you're also going to a track next week you like even more. That's Bristol. Yeah, I love Bristol. We got two wins in a Bush car. We, we finished fourth last fall there in a Cup car, so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, this win here, or this fourth place here, my wife's birthday is tomorrow. I'm gonna go buy our good present. Okay, happy birthday to Lynn behind us, and uh, he finishes fourth today. And Bill Weber is caught up with a fellow who rounds out the top five, Derek Cope. Bill? Derek, a great run for you today. Well, thanks. You know, uh, we're, we're just delighted for Straight Arrow and Hill South and Danko Coppers because, you know, we've been battling this thing, you know, and we had a little trouble today. The car wasn't right early, and we just, 
you know, I got to give my hats off to the guys because they worked so hard and just kept coming in, making changes, and they got the car where I could drive it. And then we got some good track position and, uh, you know, made a run at it. Well, track position, because a lot of guys were kind of like in the garage looking for sheet metal out there. Well, today. it was an awful tough race, you know, awful lot of uh, attrition and people pushing and shoving. And, you know, the racetrack got pretty dirty, so a lot of problems. But, uh, you know, we just tried to maintain a good uh, patient day and try to put ourselves in a position to be here at the end and worked on the car, and it worked out for us. Derek Cope and the Bobby Adelson team with a good finish today. Back upstairs. All right, and uh, Chevrolet now has won the five out of the last six Trans-South events. The average speed today was only 111 miles an hour, and here are the standings. We will also tell you that Bobby Labonte has been transported to a local hospital. They're going to x-ray his shoulder to see if there are any broken bones. Jeff Bodine, all his problems. Had a good finish today, Elliot. And all the fellows you see here, folks, had troubles, serious <laughs> troubles. Yeah, some of them had some real serious trouble, but Labonte, the only driver to suffer any injury. But it has been an absolutely incredible Trans South Financial 400 that was won here today by Sterling Marlin. Oh, Ricky Craven yeah. had the distinction of finishing last today. Well, we're going to Bristol, Tennessee next week. And coming up next here on ESPN is the Grand Prix of Brazil, the opener for the Formula One season for 1995 with Damon Hill on the pole for that race. And for once, I was delighted to have the in-car radio communications today from Race and Electronics. They will talk to Daryl and Michael Waltrip and get their insight, which I knew would be very good. It always is. And we see the fans milling around as the trucks begin to leave. One of the largest crowds, maybe the largest crowd ever for the spring race here at Darlington. Next Sunday, we'll be on the air at 1 o'clock Eastern time for the Food City 500 on a racetrack that always has a lot of excitement for us, Bristol International Raceway in Tennessee. So join us at 1 o'clock next Sunday afternoon for more NASCAR Winston Cup racing. For Ned Jarrett, Benny Parsons, John Kernan, Bill Weber, and Dr. Jerry Punch. This is Bob Jenkins. See you next week. So long, everyone. Woo!